<laughs> so you can start now. Yeah. So good evening, all. Welcome to the first meeting of the Mumbai chapter of SFM. I hope you all are doing good in this pandemic at times. And uh, the topic that we have chosen specifically today is fetal infections. Firstly, because it has not been covered extensively yet in any of the webinars. And second, mainly we do at times in our clinical practice come face to face with scenarios which touch upon fetal infections. And we are in a huge dilemma because this, as you, you will eventually see, requires a lot of clinical lab as well as ultrasound correlation to guide the patient and to counsel the patient for further management. And hence, we have an array of extensively you know, uh, distinguished speakers and panelists today who are going to take us through the, all the aspects of fetal infection, starting from its clinical aspects to the ultrasound aspects, and another highlight of this program is going to be the panel discussion, which will discuss the case-based scenarios that we actually face in our day-to-day -day practice. So I uh, invite our first speaker, Dr. Vandana Bansal. She is going to talk on the clinical aspects or the clinical uh, perspective to fetal infections. She is an um, head of unit in the Vadia uh, General Hospital and she is the head of department of the fetal medicine, Surya Mother and Care Child Institute. She's extensively known in Mumbai and Maharashtra for her fetal medicine skills. And she is going to talk on the clinical perspectives of, of, from, of fetal infection. Over to you, Dr. Vandana. Dr. Vandana? Dr. Vandana got dis uh, disconnected. Let I me... guess she'll reconnect in a few seconds. So the whole uh, idea of this program uh, goes to Dr. Ashok Khurana, who wanted the Mumbai chapter to start a, a clinical meet. And hence, uh, the initiative was led uh, by the Mumbai team. And we are glad that all the faculty today consented for the first uh, Mumbai meeting scenario. And the uh, topic per se, was carefully chosen because we do at times face these difficult scenarios when patients come to you and they come to you for second opinions and you see fetal growth restriction and you don't know what to do or what to counsel or how to even take it further. Sometimes, you know, you are at a loss to ex you know, explain the invasive procedures which might actually benefit after 21 weeks when the cutoff is actually 20 weeks. So these are the types of scenarios that... Uh, we're going to actually deal with today. And I'm uh, very glad that this panel discussion is being moderated by uh, two, one of the finest clinicians from AIMS, Dr. Uh, K. Aparna Sharma and Dr. Anubhuti Rana, who have uh, extensively researched these topics and the panelists today are going to actually simplify things for you in clinical practice. Uh, has uh, Dr. Vandana joined yet? No, sir. Uh, Dr. Kurana, can you take it over? I'll just try and call her. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. We... I'll just try and call her meanwhile. Yeah. Let's see what. Yeah. Also, there's been so much uh, recent work in intrauterine infections that we truly thought that we needed an update. And the, the problem that is happening is our usual situation that we are working in our own little cocoons or silos as they call them these days, where uh, the, the clinician is not sure about what's the progress in the lab and the lab is not sure on what techniques are to be used and the labs just use whatever they have, not realizing that 
it's such an important decision here between, for instance, carrying on or not carrying on uh, with the pregnancy because a lot of uh, parents would opt for a termination. And that's, uh, you can't base that on flimsy evidence. And the third situation is that we seem to take ultrasound out of perspective completely in the sense that we do know that there would be a large number of affected fetuses that would show no signs of disease. And yet there would be fetuses that show extensive ultrasound signs of disease and um, it may not correlate with the outcomes. And therefore we have a whole situation that is going to be discussed uh, by both our presenters in the, in the beginning. And I see Dr. Vanna Bansal is back. So uh, Dr. Vanna, are you, we can see you now. Um, and if you can unmute, then perhaps we'd be able to hear you as well. I, yes, so we made you co-host. So I think you should be able to unmute and perhaps catch on. Yeah, and uh, so both of these will be covered. And then of course, as you will learn uh, during the course of the evening, we now have uh, excellent guidelines uh, from ISWOG, the International Society for Ultrasound and Obstetrics and Gynecology. And these came out um, this year and have now been published in, the, uh, in, in, their, uh, September, uh, in their September issue. And these are very, very specific uh, guidelines that guide you through the clinical management. They may not sit and tell you um, everything from A to Z, but certainly decision-making management is something that, uh, we, we, uh, that is going to be evident. And we're going to discuss all of that as the evening uh, wears on. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Vandana Bansal, are you ready now? For, yeah. Share screen? Yes. Excellent. Marvelous. We're all set to go. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible and we see you full screen. Excellent. All right. So uh, I'll start on fetal infections. So I've been given the topic for this half an hour to speak on the clinical perspective. So basically what I'm going to do in the next half an hour is talk about how an obstetrician gets into trouble while having fetal infection and how do we come out of that? So we know symptomatic viral infections are 5% of all pregnant women will get it, but much more are clinically silent infections that they don't present at all with clinical infection. And so the problem is that there is a huge amount of these subclinical maternal infections, which can cause a mother to child transmission and will lead on to severe congenital syndromes. And the more problem is that the clinical diagnosis is difficult because the serology is often confusing and we don't have any pre-pregnancy blood samples to correlate with. And so in the next few minutes, we will talk about them. So I will go through how an obstetrician would get, uh, will question on what needs to be done. So first is, do we do routine antenatal screening? And if yes, no. So we routinely don't do antenatal screening for torch infection. So do we say, throw it in the dustbin? No, we can't even throw it in the dustbin because torch is important. And it is important when, when we have an exposure to an infectious pathogen. So you know there has been an infection and so you will test it. Second, if you see sonographic markers, which Chandar will talk about. Third is if the mother has got infection at that moment of time when she's pregnant. Fourth is if there is a sudden intrauterine death. So an IUFT, torch infection needs to be done immediately at the time of the death in the next one week. And if there's an immunocompromised uh, patient. So routine is not, but it needs to be done when it is indicated. So it has to be very judicially, judiciously used. So now let us go on to toxoplasmosis first. I'm not going to talk about the life cycle, but what we need to understand is that cat is the definitive host and how do the mother get infection either through the fat, uh, the cat feces, or if the vegetables have not been cleaned properly or an uncooked uh, meat that we have. So this is basically the three ways that it can reach the mother. And what does the mother have? It does not have much symptoms at all. So when there is toxoplasmosis, it is completely asymptomatic. It is benign, it is self-limiting and the toxoplasmosis will go away. What you need to understand is that fetal infection will only occur 
as a primary infection. There is no recurrent infection in toxoplasmosis. And second is if it has occurred prior to conception, it will not transmit to the fetus later on. So we told you the mother doesn't have infection, but what does the fetus have? The fetus has got a very high chance of vertical transmission as much as 20 to 50 percent. And they may be asymptomatic at birth, but will have played sequelae. And we know the classical triad affects the brain and the eyes. So chorioretinitis, intracranial calcification, and hydrocephalus. So we know all these markers of infection. I'm not going to go into details of this. And what is more important is to look for IUGR also. So if there is IUGR, there may be a fetal infection. That will be covered in the next talk. I am going to take only the clinical part of this. So when we look at antibodies, the first antibody which appears is the IgM antibodies, which appear within immediately after the acute infection and peaks at about one month of gestation, one month of infection. And then it starts coming down. It may remain for about a year or even two years in toxoplasmosis. So in IgM, the problem in toxoplasmosis is that this IgM may remain positive for a very long time. The IgG will appear a little later after the IgM antibodies and will remain high and then plateau and remain throughout life. So IgG will always be present after an infection. IgM will come down. In some, it may come down completely. And in some, it may go on for one to two years. So this is a guide for all the infections that we have. So if you have IgG antibodies and IgM antibodies, both negative, that means the patient has never had an infection. She is susceptible to infection. And if it is rubella, you give them rubella vaccination. Look at the other boxes I'm going to tell you. If the IgM is positive and the IgG is negative, this is a, an acute infection. So we know that the IgG, she's never had an infection. She has got it now because the IgM is positive. Look at this uh, third box. If the IgM is positive, IgG is equivocal. That means IgG has started to increase. So again, this is possibility of infection. You might do an IgG avidity to see whether it is low or not. The most confusing is IgM and IgG both positive. Here we don't know whether it's an old infection with an IgM which is false positive or it is an acute infection. So here, the most important thing is to look at the IgG avidity. On the other hand, if IgM is negative and IgG is positive, that would mean it's an old infection in most possibilities. But we will look at some cases when we have to. So what is this IgG avidity? So it is the affinity of the antibody to the antigen. So if it is a long drawn infection, then the affinity is more two friends very close to each other for a long time will have good affinity. So high affinity means she has got an old infection. Low affinity or low avidity means she has a recent infection. So that is how if you have an avidity which is low, it would suggest that there is a recent infection that we've had. So going through some of such similar queries that we had as an obstetrician as a fetal medicine, so we said intrauterine fetal demise, we need to do a torch test. So this patient had one ectopic pregnancy and a second IUFD at 15 weeks. So NT scan was normal, but a screen was positive for T21. But by the time they thought we'll go for an amnio, IUFD happened. There was a low PAPI, as you can see, is 0.15. So uh, patient terminated and the products showed a normal fish. So do we do a torch here? Yes, probably because an IUFT could be because of placental disease, but more could be also infection. So these are obstetrician. These are the reports that were given to me later on. So first test, both positive. Started on spiromycin, non-pregnant state. So one is, do we start spiromycin in the non-pregnant state? Probably no. So then repeated after four weeks, again, both positive. Three months later, still positive. Six months later, different lab, still positive. One is different labs, you cannot correlate. And second, the IgM is positive for almost a year now. And over and above that, she has been, uh, IUI has happened and she has now conceived with this IgM and IgG positive. So these all values are all questionable. Is she having an infection with toxoplasmosis or she's not having an infection? So first we need to find out that. 
so igg and igms both positive in this asymptomatic non pregnant women do we give uh, uh, spiramycin no it doesn't need to be given how frequent to test 3 to 4 weeks you want to see the igg titers increasing how long to keep waiting for her to advise pregnancy so we will have to first prove that she doesn't have a toxo infection and then allow her to pre get pregnant but now that she is pregnant first thing is you do an avidity test so the avidity here is high avidity 42% so this toxo although was still positive for igm and igg the avidity was high and so that proves that she probably does not have a acute infection at the moment and she is pregnant now so we do all other tests and we found that she has protein s and antithrombin 3 negative uh, uh, low values so she was started on low molecular weight heparin and aspirin folic acid and followed up with nt and fts and other things so do we continue her spiramycin do we do amniocentesis no because we have proven that she doesn't have a toxoplasmosis maternal infection so the messages for toxoplasma igm may remain positive for up to 2 years after the end of primary infection second is a certain ment of the time of infection is very challenging if it is igg and igm positive so i avidity is the test which will tell us whether it's an old infection if it is high avidity it is past infection of more than 3 months and if it is low avidity it is recent infection the other way is to see for titers rising if the igg titers rise by four fold in four weeks time then we would be we would still think it is an acute infection everybody does torch test for recurrent pregnancy losses so should we do should we not do in between obstetrician most conferences said torch is not to be done in recurrent pregnancy loss throw it in the dustbin but every now and then we get these reports of torch positive and sent to us so here this patient as usual all toxo rubella cmv igg positive igm all negative so where are we we are at 14 to 15 weeks and igg is positive igm negative probably it's an old infection we don't need to worry but we said okay we repeat the titers after 4 weeks and by that time she'll come for normally scan we would look at that but at 20 weeks when she came uh, not 4 weeks she came after 6 week and we see markers of infection so we see hepatomegaly there are calcifications there is a myocardial calcification as well so now the the iggs are significant now because we have got now markers on ultrasound so we cannot say those iggs are uh, not infection and so these markers are telling us to reassess the infection serology and so what do we do next is to do an avidity test as well as look at the titers so toxo igg was rising fourfold toxo igm was still negative so in spite of toxo igm negative igg was rising and so there is an active toxo infection and so we now that the baby also has got ultrasound markers the baby is already infected so what is the probability of infection first trimester placenta saves the fetus so if only 15% transmission in toxoplasmosis but if it occurs it is severe so this patient probably had infection in the first trimester and so presented by 20 weeks with a bad infection and later on the transmission is more the disease is mild and so do we treat this fetus or we terminate she is beyond 20 weeks so we had to look at other things so do we do an amniocentesis for this patient yes so when do we do amniocentesis if igm is positive igg negative that means there is a maternal infection igg igm both positive with low avidity again means infection if both igg igm positive high avidity but in the second and third trimester because we don't know whether she was infected in the first trimester also or a rising titer of igg we would still still do an amniocentesis or if we have two samples one pre pregnancy and one post pregnancy and igg is positive we would do or if there are markers of infection so these are specific indications for amniocentesis if we have a maternal primary infection and what do you do in the amniocentesis you test for toxo pcr um, in the amniotic fluid not in the blood pcr is done better in the amnio amniocentesis because diuresis is what presents with the infection so they need to be done after 18 weeks of gestation and at least 6 weeks from the time of the infection 
so usually it comes to about 18 weeks and the report will come to us within a week's time so if we have an amniocentesis which shows as toxoplasmosis negative what do we do and if it shows positive what do we do so if we have a primary maternal infection which is confirmed then you would start on spiramycin even before the amniocentesis so you had an infection in the first trimester you will not wait for amniocentesis and then start spiramycin you would start spiramycin whenever the maternal infection is proved so your spiramycin 1 g 3 times a day is to be started continued you do the amniocentesis if the pcr is negative then also continue the spiramycin you don't need to stop spiramycin because it reduces the risk of transmission and spiramycin is not useful if the pcr comes positive in this patient because the ultrasound was already having markers we have almost pro proven uh, that there is a fetal infection and so here spiramycin is not going to help so if there is a proven infection then you have to start on pyrimethamine and sulfadoxin combination along with folinic acid because this is what crosses the placenta so first trimester you can't give it but after the first trimester if there is a positive amniotic fluid or maternal infection in the later weeks of gestation or ultrasound showing abnormality you will start them on pyrimethamine sulfadoxin and not on spiramycin spiramycin is for those where you suspect maternal infection but no fetal infection but does it completely cure it no this baby already has got markers it is not going to completely cure it it may reduce the severity of infection so amniocentesis showed a toch pcr negative but in spite of that because there were markers she was started on treatment and went on till 38 weeks growth was small hepatomegaly continued calcification continued and what is obstetric management obstetric management will remain same because it will cha not change by presence of infection vaginal delivery can be allowed breastfeeding can again be allowed does the mother and fetus cause problem for the healthcare provider no and both need not be isolated from each other so for toxoplasmosis this is the standard of care so here this patient was asymptomatic on day 1 but the neurosonogram showed ventricular megaly there is some cystic and cephalomegaly and also intracranial calcification and the baby had convulsions on day 3 so we were already prime that this baby is going to have problem and if you see intracranial calcification the chance of having mental retardation is very high so presence of calcification is an indicator of severe mental retardation and absence of toxo pcr in the amniotic fluid does not always rule out an infection so if you see ultrasound markers you would be worried and you would want to start treatment after birth in this case because the pcr was negative we continued to do an igg after 6 month which was also positive so the message is again are markers of infection will give you a clue to look at infection four four rise even if igm is negative may also be worrying so you don't just say igg positive igm negative is nothing to do you need to repeat the titers after four week medical treatment only if there is uh, no fetal infection it will reduce the risk of transmission and pyrimethamine sulfadoxin if the baby is infected it will reduce the severity but not cure the fetus completely so coming on to rubella a primary gravida md medicine student from km she had a macular papular rash and came to ask for opinion for termination so how do we investigate so you look at the vaccination status because rubella mmr is given to most patients if you don't have a history then do a rubella igg igm and so this uh, girl was not vaccinated but igm was equivocal igg negative with a rash which was very typical of rubella so rubella the risk of transmission in the first trimester is 80% and it is severe so first trimester infection of rubella is very worrying to us maybe the third trimester is milder but first trimester rubella may be associated with congenital rubella syndrome so the patient decided to do an mtp now coming on to iugr with every iugr do i test for toch infections maybe not for all iugrs if i see a placental disease i may not do it but if you have something like this you have an very early onset iugr presented to us at 29 weeks with polyhydramnios with a small vst that we looked at with normal doppler flows so doppler's uterines being normal 
and a very significant growth retardation, I would be worried about. But what do we do as obstetrician? I would look at LA, CLA, do a GTT, do a thyroid, look at all those things. And in the meantime, somebody also did a torch test and again, everything came positive for IgG. So toxo, rubella, CMV, all positive, IgMs, all negative. And the avidity was high for rubella, toxo, CMV. So high avidity is an old infection. But old means three months behind. This is 29 weeks fetus. So I don't know whether the baby was infected in the first trimester or not. So what do we do? Do we do an amniocentesis at 29 weeks is something we would be uh, contemplating and we will see it at birth. And we followed it up and at 37 weeks, 1.2 kgs, congenital cataract, IUGR, and also at sensory neural deafness. So not all IUGRs are placental disease. It could be infection. So do we should we have tested at 29 weeks or not is what needs to be looked at. So presence of early IUGR, especially with normal Doppler, or think of torch infection. And the risk of fetal infection is very high in the first trimester for rubella and we have no treatment available. So the messages for rubella, by the time this ultrasound markers are present themselves, insult has already occurred and the serology may come normal. You may have an IgM which has become negative as in this case and only IgGs were positive. Avidity may also not help in the late trimester because avidity will only tell you for the past three months. And amniocentesis may also not pick up. So should we have done an amniocentesis and given her the risk of, an in, of a preterm PROM is what needs to be contemplated. So coming on to CMV infection. So we know congenital CMV is the most common cause for mental retardation and sensory neural hearing losses. And the risk is about 0.2 to 2%. So if a child has got, a previous child has got CMV infection, so this baby detected CMV at first month neonatal age and is having hearing aid. Next pregnancy, that patient has come after eight years and saying that I don't want to have a CMV infection again. So is it possible that CMV can cause recurrent infection? So test for torch titers were done. CMV IgGs were positive, IgM was negative. So reassured the patient, but can she also have a recurrent infection? And what is the advantage of knowing whether it's a primary infection or a secondary infection? So the risk of vertical transmission, if it is a primary infection is 35 to 40%. But if it is a reinfection or a reactivation, the risk of transmission is only 1%. So in, this works similar to toxo. So first trimester, risk of transmission is less, but very severe. And third trimester, risk of transmission is more but the disease is mild. So toxo works like CMV and rubella is different. Rubella has got severe infection in the first trimester and severe disease as well. So we, it's important to know whether it's primary or reinfection. CMV is the only one infection where you can have a recurrent infection. And so you need to know how to differentiate primary infection from secondary infection. So if there is a IgM positive with low IgG avidity, that means IgM positive means acute infection. Low avidity means it's a primary infection. Then we would be worried. If it is reinfection, IgM will be positive and IgG will be high. If IgG is high with an IgM positive, that means it, she had an infection earlier also and she has got a reinfection now. So IgM positive with avidity high would not mean no infection or old infection. It means there is a reactivation of an infection. So this patient uh, has come to us at 24 weeks of gestation, mild ventricular megaly. There is some ecogenic bowel loops we are seeing. There's the liver calci calcification that we look at, polyhydramnios. There's some pericardial effusion also, and there was an IUGR. So do we do cord blood or do we do amniocentesis? Again, CMV is produced from the urine and in the amniotic fluid. So it is amniocentesis, which is better to look for torch PCR with a sensitivity of almost 98%. And again, it needs to be done after 18 to 20 weeks, as I told in the toxoplasmosis also. So this patient who had all these markers, amniotic fluid was tested and it came out as CMV positive. So we know there is an infection. We know there are ultrasound markers also. Is there any treatment which is available? Toxo, yes, pyramycin and uh, other things were good, 
but here gancyclovir uh, may be given not good results there is a lot of controversy in most of the literature and whether immunoglobulins can be given again she already has a cmv infection so maybe gancyclovir or valacyclovir can be given but uh, not very good results so once you have an infection of cmv how do you prognosticate is it a severe disease or it's a mild disease so any sonographic markers imply it is poor outcome absence does not guarantee normal outcome but it is little better if we don't have any structural abnormalities on ultrasound and if the pcr is also uh, very low so a high viral load in amniotic fluid so you can quantify the amount of viral load both in the amniotic fluid and in the cord blood so cordocentesis can also be done which has a slightly higher risk but the advantage is that you can look at the platelet count so if the platelet count is also low that would again suggest there is a active infection and a disease which is got more severity and if a baby is symptomatic at birth so this chart is showing you that a primary infection causes 30% fetal infection so if the fetus is infected and symptomatic at birth then almost 90% will have complication 30% will have mortality so almost everybody who is symptomatic at birth will have a severe disease while if it is asymptomatic uh, uh, child at birth then also about 15% will have complications so cmv is very bad infection if you get it and so and it does not have much treatment the only infection which has got a good treatment as well as uh, doesn't have much of fetal morbidity is parvovirus infection this again doesn't usually present in the mother with any symptoms but we suspect when we see a non immune high drops so this low risk patient 19 weeks o positive blood group so o positive with non immune high drops you would look at chromosomes you would look at microarray you would do a hemoglobin cord blood sampling but you would also look at the parvovirus so in this case because we were not sure what to do so we did a maternal parvovirus first and the mother came out as positive for parvovirus and here you can see there is some high drops which we can look at so the risk of transmission is about 25 to 33 percent and so what do we look at is mca psv so if there is fetal anemia that means the parvovirus is causing an aplastic crisis and there is anemia and it may also cause myocarditis so if we find mca psv which is very high this 20 weeks fetus was 52 velocity which is above 1.5 mom so the treatment modality is to give intrauterine transfusion just to tide over that crisis so this parvovirus remains for some time and then it comes back to normal so it is during the infection time that you need to give them intrauterine transfusion so this patient was started on an intrauterine transfusion the uh, you have to be careful in this is because there is myocardial dysfunction if you overload the fetus there will be a cardiac uh, arrest also so you need to give them transfusion usually only one transfusion is required because by that time the parvo infection will go off and the baby will res resolve back second is do not give overload the fetus you may give a little lower than what is required in cases of parvo virus and later on no significant lo uh, long term adverse effects are seen so you can see here that the blood is being transfused into the cord so i conclude is ultrasound markers for fetal infection are prognostic indicators for poor fetal outcome so if you see markers you have to be worried about the outcome routine toy test in low risk population not required instead it is important to look for these markers on ultrasound during anomaly scan and even later on also because not necessary that the anomaly scan will show you infection igg titers positive with igm negative may suggest infection if the titers are rising early or late in gestation diagnosis of iugr should trigger a re look at markers for infection and maybe look at torch infection if we need to do gestational age of the fetus will influence the severity so i told you placenta is a barrier in the first trimester so both for toxo as well as for cmv first trimester infection is less the severity is more but rubella it works differently 
and primary infection can damage more than the secondary and reactivation. For CMV is the only one which can cause reactivation, but the risk in reactivation is only 1%. All these agents have a distinct manifestation, but all of them will have similar ultrasound markers. And so for the next part of the talk, I will ask Dr. Chandalula to look at ultrasound markers for fecal infection. I tried bringing in all the clinical things that we as obstetrician come across. And maybe now as a radiologist, Dr. Chandar will talk about the ultrasound part of it. And you did well, Dr. Vandana. You have comprehensively covered yet simplifying things. I know at times IgG, IgM becomes too much to handle, but you've really simplified it well. And uh, you have categorized the infections quite well. So it's a, it's been a comprehensive coverage of fetal infection. And thank you. Do hang around for questions. You have a lot of questions in the box, but I guess we'll take them at the end of the show. So I now invite Dr. Chandar Lulla to take this discussion forward by talking about the ultrasound signs in fetal infection. He's the head of department of ultrasound at Just Look Hospital, and he's been extensively practicing fetal medicine since many years in Mumbai. He is a national and an international speaker in uh, obstetric ultrasound, and I'm sure he's going to do a great job in fetal infections. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mohit. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Loud uh, and clear. Uh, thank you once again for the invitation and the kind words, and of course, uh, to Ashok to take uh, this society so far ahead. And uh, thank you, Vandana. That was a wonderful talk uh, and made my job a little simpler. Uh, from the point of view of uh, the clinical part, which is always a little confusing. So in, when we deal with uh, congenital fetal in infections, uh, I like these two statements. Uh, you can only see what you're looking for. So you, you need to have a, a, a keen eye to look for infection and the signs of infection and in ultrasound, and then you start picking them up. And then the second thing, as Vandana always say, has said, uh, that the biology of the infections and timing of the infection is very, very important for us to see ultrasound signs or not see ultrasound signs. So, of course, we have a whole spectrum of uh, pathogens uh, in, uh, which are uh, now causing uh, us a huge headache uh, in, in our day-to-day -day practice. So we have CMV, toxoplasmosis, parvovirus, rubella, varicella, Zika some time back, and now there's COVID. Of course, fortunately, no uh, proven signs, antenatal ultrasound appearances of uh, COVID, but there are some uh, 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 features which affect the pregnancy. So let's talk about clinical perspective. One has al already spoken. She's already spoken about the overview of tests in fetal infections. Uh, I'll talk about the ultrasound features and prognosis she has touched upon a bit. So uh, we used to initially call it TORCH, and now it's TORCH because uh, there's a rise of syphilis also. There's parvovirus, so it's TORCH PV. And the common infections, as she has just said, is of course uh, CMV, Toxo, Rubella, and then the other uh, viruses. And uh, added to that, now we are seeing SARS, MERS, Zika, COVID-19. Uh, of course, we, I, at least personally, I haven't seen Zika, but it's uh, supposed to be uh, quite prevalent in India, but I don't know whether I have, uh, uh, you know, we have seen microcephaly, but never proven it to be Zika. So I don't know if anybody has had experience with Zika and probably the panel discussion can uh, look into that. Uh, so this is already covered. 5% of pregnancies uh, have, uh, can have viral infections. 1% have overt intra-amniotic infections and many silent infections uh, go undetected. <coughs> Sorry. Now, what's important is that fortunately, uh, uh, the only 10% of infection, uh, the fetuses which are affected are symptomatic at birth, and 90% are asymptomatic. But even the asymptomatic fetuses or the neonates have to be analyzed for their urine uh, viral load because they can lead to in 10% progressive hearing loss and in a, a smaller percentage uh, with lower IQ. So it's very, very important that the evaluation doesn't stop at the antenatal stage, but continues
continues into the neonatal stage. And of course, if the, if the fetus is affected and there's a symptomatic uh, situation, you can get five to 10% death and about 50% across the board of hearing loss, IQ lower than 70% and of course, microcephaly and CN, CNS manifestations. Now, the three important things are when did the infection occur? So Vandana has already alluded to that concept whether it occurred before or after conception and the different pathogens, how they behave. Maternal serology, which is usually non-intended uh, sometimes in our situation or intended if we find something uh, on the ultrasound or if we find something funny happening on the growth scan. And of course, the more common features that we would see is the ultrasound abnormality. Now, you must always have your chart in, in your mind. Uh, and I think uh, Vandana has done a beautiful job uh, for this, uh, but for us, sometimes it's difficult to remember these things. So it's very important that you keep your chart and rely on these charts to, you know, quickly plot of uh, what exactly you're dealing with. So if it's, of course, an uh, acute infection, you've got uh, uh, IgM that is positive, which doesn't last for too long, uh, but uh, it can become negative, and then the IgG remains positive, and then you rely on the avidity test, and that's how I like to keep it simple. And of course, if both are positive, it can be a recent primary infection. And uh, uh, so there we start from there and then uh, we uh, uh, look at positive ultrasound features. Uh, if, if, if you have ultrasound features and a positive IgG, we really don't bother about uh, uh, doing an avidity, we straight away go for an amnio. That, that's very, very important because uh, it will only tell you, but ultimately if you have ultrasound features which are very strong, uh, which we'll be talking about, then you will straight away go for an amnio. And the only reassuring sign is, of course, uh, if you have both IgG and IgM, uh, which are negative, and uh, uh, then that is a reassuring sign. So what's the role of ultrasound? Of course, for the diagnosis, uh, looking for specific signs of infection. And of course, you need to do invasive procedures, uh, the cord sampling, the amniocentesis, uh, more importantly, amniocentesis. And prognostication, really speaking, it's the prognostication of how the fetus is going to behave into a neonate uh, once there is a suspicion of an infection or something wrong you have found on ultrasound. Now, if you've got a, a fetus which is suspect for having an infection, uh, as uh, Vandana said, uh, we, uh, this is very, very important that you don't jump into an amniocentesis. You have to time it well. It takes about six weeks for the virus to get excreted in by the fetal kidneys into the amniotic fluid. So you have to do the amniocentesis uh, six weeks after the uh, uh, viral infection or at least after 20 weeks or 18 weeks uh, because that, that's when micturation starts. And before that, there is no point in doing an amniocentesis. Uh, here you can see the placenta is thick, the kidneys are echogenic, then they will secrete the virus and then you will do an amniocentesis and pick up the uh, DNA of the virus or do a PCR test. Uh, uh, yeah. So the uh, real-time PCR is the reliable technique and it is quite sensitive and specific. Uh, sorry, my computer is behaving a little funny. One minute, yeah. So it's quite uh, specific in the sense that if you do it at an appropriate time, you can have false positives and false negatives. False negative can be if you did it before six weeks or before 18 weeks. And false positive, sometimes maternal blood uh, DNA can come into the amniotic fluid and you can get a false positive and yet the neonate is not effective, affected. So these are the two important things one must remember when you're doing an amniocentesis. Otherwise, if the, if the conditions are ideal that you're waited for six weeks, you're waited for uh, mixturation to start after 18 weeks, then you have a sensitivity as close to 100%. So once you have a positive CMV PCR, that's when really uh, the role of ultrasound begins because you don't see uh, very early changes on ultrasound, except of course in parovirus where you can see first trimester uh, generalized high drops. And then you follow up in most other infections on a two weekly ultrasound and uh, an MRI after 30 weeks. Uh, generally speaking, if is this going? Okay, generally speaking, if there are no cerebral anomalies, that's a golden rule that you continue the pregnancy, you can offer treatment as Vandana said. And if there are cerebral anomalies, then of course you consider termination of pregnancy. So these are two broad groups of abnormalities, which we will discuss uh, 
Now, the problem is that sonography may not always show changes uh, of infection uh, in, in all fetuses. So a, that's very important to remember that a normal scan does not exclude a congenital fetal infection. Uh, we have to be very careful when you counsel the parents. And in various studies, you can see that the pickup rate on antenatal ultrasound has been quite low. This is, of course, uh, very, very old studies from 2001 to 2008. Uh, but uh, probably the recent uh, literature or recent machines will pick up much more. But it has been as low as about 20% across the board. So let's finally look at what are the ultrasound findings. So two broad groups, basically. Uh, we have non-CNS findings, as I said, which we can sometimes continue, treat, etc. And of course, if there are CNS findings, then termination is the best option. So you can see the virus affects the placenta, the capillary endothelium of the placenta. It can cause decrease in the amniotic fluid. It can cause a, a direct involvement of the various viscera, the liver, the spleen, and cause visceromegaly and inflammation. And then you have cerebral uh, inflammation with ventriculomegaly and other malformations which follow downstream. Uh, the fetus myocardium gets affected and you can have high drops with fluid collections. The reticuloendothelial system gets affected. You get fetal anemia. Uh, you can get fetal growth restriction because there is vasculitis involving the placenta. And finally, of course, uh, many cases of fetal demise can be due to viral infections. So when you see a placenta, which is markedly bulky, now the important thing is that many of these signs may be clubbed together and you may see a group of signs or a group of stigmata when you're doing the ultrasound. So they may not be very individual. So you'll see a, a cluster of signs and which makes you suspect that this could be an infection and then you decide to do further investigations or if the investigations have already been done, you're following up these fetuses and you see such bad situations where there's almost no lica, the fetus is markedly growth restricted. The placenta is very, very bulky, more than uh, at least four to five centimeters. You may have uh, ac uh, ac accelerated class, uh, calcification. It may appear very uh, shaggy and heterogeneous. And especially uh, when I see first, uh, second trimester calcifications, I'm very worried. Is this uh, with uh, oligohydramnios? Is this uh, an involvement of an infection? So the hematogenous root and the direct cytotoxic route causes inflammation, edema, placentitis, and uh, 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 accelerated cal calcification, which leads to uh, kind of involvement from there of the kidneys. You have nephritis, and which may represent as echogenic kidneys, and finally, severe oligohydramnia. So that is the uh, cycle which leads us to uh, suspect that there could be something wrong and which could be an infectious situation. And then we look at specific uh, organs. And of course, if the liver is enlarged and you have calcification, then you know you're dealing with a, a, a viral infection, uh, which is causing, uh, it could be a CMV. And if the liver is here, you can see there are charts available for the liver and spleen and the kidneys. Uh, but generally, you, you can actually visualize that the liver is enlarged and it is, uh, 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 you know that there is a problem here. So here you can see in this situation, the spleen is also enlarged and shifting the stomach down. And there's massive splenomegaly, there's a little bit of ascites. And so this points in favor of, uh, of an infection here. The other common finding that you may find is an echogenic bowel. Of course, it's non-specific and it can be seen in various conditions, uh, intrauterine bleed, chromosomal abnormalities, cystic fibrosis, but infections is the one which may be associated with a multitude of findings. So if you see uh, 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 high drops and if you see other findings which uh, uh, direct you to the possibility of, uh, so whenever we see a, a, a hyperechoic bowel, we will usually do both a genetic evaluation and an infectious screen e evaluation. And then the, the virus or the pathogen may affect the GI system. And you may see the typical appearances of meconium peritonitis, ascites, ileus, bowel dilatation. And finally, uh, these calcifications uh, due to pseudocyst formation in the meconium. 
and uh, they then get calcified and they can be quite gross in appearance. They can be self-limiting. Uh, we have seen sometimes that the, uh, these changes disappear, uh, but at most times, if it's a bad viral infection, as you can see here, there's marked high drops and uh, there's a huge encysted collection here, uh, which does not change, which does not show peristalsis. It's got a lot of septations. It's, there are calcifications seen, bowel is echogenic. And these are essentially due to the fragility of the bowel, the bowel perforates and uh, the uh, contents causes intense peritoneal inflammation and uh, meconium peritonitis. And you can see that there is a, a multitude of findings that you are seeing in this situation. So here you see that the bowel is showing echogenicity, some calcification, there is ascites, and uh, you may not get uh, uh, the IgM positive. It may be just an IgG positive at the initial stage. And uh, you then resort to an amnio and the PCR is positive. And of course, the karyotype is normal and this points in favor of uh, it being uh, an intrauterine infection. Sometimes the fluid is very turbid. You can see here that this fetus presented with uh, kind of polyhydramnios, and there was a lot of ascites which was very turbid, and this again turned out to be an infection with there was hepatomegaly also here seen very typically here. So you may see other viscera that get involved and specifically in the chest, you may see calcification in the lung, calcification in the myocardium. Of course, there can be plural, plural and pericardial diffusion. So generally high drops with multiple fluid spaces getting affected. And uh, you can see then it finally leads to generalized high drops and uh, very, very, very poor prognosis once this stage is there. Most of the times their fetus will not make it. And uh, many of these fetuses may present with symmetrical IUGR as Vandana said earlier. And in, in most of these cases, uh, uh, you will see extensive placental calcification or bulky placenta as we call it hyperplacentosis and uh, and these can lead to these can be due to uh, early onset infection which is leading to these changes and of course the neonatal outcome is very very poor half of these would have abnormal neurological uh, evaluation uh, either on ct clinical examination or subsequently on the ultrasound if if the pregnancy has presented late. And you can see that the growth is tremendously uh, reduced over a period of time and uh, it's, it's bad prognosis. So here you see a fetus with uh, a kind of uh, very poor Dopplers. There is a large hyperplacenta, there's dilated bowel and a kind of moribund fetus, uh, which is presenting as early as 22 weeks of pregnancy. So leaving the non-CNS findings, we then go on to a, a complete cascade of events which leads to uh, the impact on the fetal brain. So the inflammatory response uh, uh, is due to the inflammatory cytokines or direct viremia and uh, uh, which causes a multitude of effects. You can have vasculitis. There is hypoxia, resulting in hypoxia and hemorrhage, they, uh, and followed up with uh, gliosis, periventricular leukomalacia. You have necrosis and apoptosis, calcification, and the clastic dysgenesis changes. And of course, as the neuronal cells get affected, there is a, a reduced in number of cells, and therefore you can get microcephaly and uh, uh, abnormal uh, motor cortical disease in the form of migrational abnormalities. So a whole list of abnormalities that you can see as has been outlined here on the right side. And let's see some of them. Uh, the CNS manifestations uh, depend again on the stage of infection. So in, if the infection has occurred in the first trimester or early second trimester, you have a tremendous loss of neurons and the glia, and this leads to the classical microcephaly as we saw in, in, in Brazil in, in this, with the involvement of the Zika virus and also with CMV and Toxo. And uh, you get extensive loss of neurons and glia leading to uh, the, uh, the lysenkephaly very thin cortex, cerebellar hypoplasia, uh, loss of brain parenchyma leading to ventriculomegaly, and then extensive calcification. If the affection is more in the late second trimester, then they present more with migrational abnormalities like polymicrogyria, etc. 
And third trimester, the uh, in involvement will be less, but you can have delayed myelination. And these changes may not be seen on ultrasound. You may see white matter disease. The gyration tends to be normal. And therefore, MRI may be useful in that particular situation. So if you've got a situation where the fetus is continued, you're not finding any CNS abnormality, be careful. You need to do a third trimester MRI because you could see changes uh, only on MRI in these late situations. Uh, uh, so what are the cluster of abnormalities uh, from the clinical point, of, from the ultrasound point of view? We would see ventricular megaly or hydrocephalus. And classically, the ventricles appear typical uh, when you're dealing with infection. You will see a lot of increased periventricular echogenicity due to the inflammatory changes seen in the uh, 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 in the periventricular area, and these will result in formation of echogenic nodules, brain calcification, and finally the vasculitis leads to pseudocyst or uh, formation. And then you also see intraventricular inflammatory changes in the form of synechia. There is loss, as I said, of uh, the uh, neural cells, the, uh, uh, in the, especially in the first trimester, leading to microcephaly, and then malformations of cortical development, as we spoke. And of course, there can be cerebellar involvement with vermian hyperplasia, hemorrhage, and other involvement of the cerebellum. Now, one of the classical features of uh, uh, at least CMB and other infections can be uh, what is called as lenticulate vasculopathy. So the moment you see these branching kind of uh, 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 linear calcifications in the, in the thalamus and basal ganglia region, this is classical of uh, uh, CMB infections. And almost 30% of patients with CMB can have unilateral or bilateral branching curvilinear streaks within the thalami. And these are, of course, it's a non-specific finding. It can be seen in some aneuploidies also, but, uh, and other uh, infections. Uh, and uh, other conditions uh, like twin twin transfusion syndrome, fetal alcohol syndrome. But in the given clinical context of an infection where you're strongly suspecting an infection, this is a very, very important marker for uh, a, a CMB infection. Now, what's important is that when you see CNS involvement, it's usually rarely isolated. So you see multitude of involvement and you don't get single signs, you don't get like isolated signs. So as the infection progresses, you will get a multiplicity. Initially, it may begin as a mild ventricular megaly. So you have a mild ventricular megaly uh, within very echogenic margin, as I said earlier, if the, if the periventricular area is very, very bright and echogenic, that's the time when we start suspecting an infection or you can get uh, uh, some kind of echogenicity, some kind of loss, neural loss, as you see here, periventricular leukomalacia with a kind of abnormal shaped ventricles. Uh, it, these are all suspicious uh, for infection. So you have ventricular megaly, ventriculitis, uh, there's associated cerebral loss here, and white matter abnormalities you may or may not see. Now, this could be very well uh, the earliest presentation. This is about 17 to 18 weeks. And I just saw this baby just yesterday. There was echogenic bowel. There's mild ventricular megaly with a bright border. But what's most striking is you see is the placenta. It's very bulky. And there are, there are a lot of calcific densities which have no business to be there as early as 17 weeks. There's cardiomegaly. There's pericardial effusion. And uh, so we didn't even bother to do the torch here. We went ahead straight and uh, we've done an amniocentesis. Of course, the fluid is also low. So we took a little bit of fluid and uh, replaced a little bit of fluid. And we are waiting for the final diagnosis. But you can see here the kidneys are bright. And there are a lot of other signs which tell you, which make you suspect that uh, this is very, very uh, uh, strong suspicion for an infection. And there's also tricuspid regurg, as you see here. Uh, this, as I said, the periventricular echogenicity may, uh, is usually due to subependymal inflammation, and then there is hemorrhage, necrosis, and finally, you will see extensive periventricular calcification, parenchymal, and otherwise. And then you may see sequelae here. There is this fetus landed up with craniosynostosis and uh, 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 following that initial bout of infection. Now, you may also see the classical sign, as I said earlier, of intraventricular inflammation. And that is typically the synechia that you see here. These are better seen with ultrasound and may not be as well seen 
uh, with uh, MRI. So you see the typical periventricular nodules here. There's a lot of echogenic material with intraventricular cyanea that you see here. And that's another fetus which is growing very slow. But typically what I wanted to highlight here was the multiple cyanea inside the ventricles seen here in the still images. And you can see small specks of calcification. So as my first slide, I told you, you only see what you want to see and you start looking for them intensely and you will pick up all these abnormalities. So there's a lot of calcification, there's asymmetric or irregular ventricular megaly, and there's a lot of cyanea all pointing towards uh, infection. Again, another fetus here, uh, you see that there's something like visceromegaly, there's placentomegaly, almost no like uh, ventriculomegaly, and all pointing in favor of an infection. And finally, the vasculitis can lead to destructive changes. So you have uh, uh, sub uh, sub uh, ependymal cyst formation and extensive lysis causing major uh, uh, destruction. And you can see here, uh, a large amount of destruction is seen here following an infectious episode. Now, this was a fetus who presented with uh, 27 weeks uh, 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 as late as that, uh, the earlier scans were all normal. Uh, there was moderate ventriculomegaly with echogenic mar margins. The nodules uh, uh, we shall just see in a minute. Uh, parenchyma, periventricular uh, changes, mild cardiomegaly, pericardial effusion, ascites. The PSV was not very high. It was 1.4 norms. But what you can see here is a small speck of calcification in the liver but, uh, and further small other specks. And uh, the moment we see calcification, of course, it puts us to guard. And there is, of course, uh, ascites. But look at the CNS changes. This is, this is gross. So here we are seeing ventricular megaly and multiple large nodules. These are all kind of infectious uh, granuloma type of lesions, which will ultimately get calcified. And uh, you can see the periventricular haze here, uh, the typical evidence of uh, uh, ventriculitis. And what also I wish to point out is in, in many situations, especially in toxoplasmosis, you will see involvement of the orbit. So in this acute infectious stage, you can see a lot of fluid, hazy fluid uh, uh, with echoes in the orbit and ultimately will land up with the uh, chorioretinitis. And this is actually representing chorioretinitis. And uh, uh, in, uh, finally, you will see uh, uh, calcification. So just see the nodules. And typically, you may see in involvement of the temporal lobe here. You will see small lytic lesions which are seen in the temporal lobe here and the basal ganglia region, which is all very, very classical of a, a, a CMB infection. So this is a major, major infection here. And of course, as I said earlier, uh, we need to consider termination. And finally, uh, the destructive changes uh, will lead to calcification. And you may see uh, it, sometimes this fetus may present as in this particular situation, there was severe FGR at 36 weeks with microcephaly and extensive periventricular calcification is seen in this particular series, uh, situation. So all classical signs of uh, 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 intrauterine uh, uh, infection. And then, as I said earlier, if you are dealing with the first trimester involvement, you may see microcephaly or microencephaly because the brain shrinks uh, and you may see extens uh, uh, extensive fluid around the brain because the brain has shrunk. There's also ventricular megaly. You may see other uh, destructive phenomena. As you can see here, there is holoproxism kephaly with microcephaly. And then uh, you may see hemorrhagic changes. As uh, Vandana alluded to earlier, you get thrombocytopenia in, in, in many of these conditions. And this can lead to uh, hemorrhage both in the cerebellum. Here you can see that there is cerebellar hemorrhage uh, unilateral here. And the prognosis is very, very uncertain. And uh, uh, it, it, it depends on the sequential changes that you may see here. Now here, following destructive changes, you can see there's almost severe hydrocephalus with a lot of destructive changes and following hemorrhage, uh, there's a lot of uh, destruction of the uh, uh, brain parenchyma and this communicating hydrocephalus or obstructive hydrocephalus, which has developed. Uh, and you have uh, the entire 
uh, all the ventricular systems that are involved. Sometimes it may present with subtle findings. So you may just see ventricular megaly with a very, very shrunken and uh, atopic cerebellum. So hypoplasia of the cerebellum uh, with other signs can be also a manifestation of infection. And finally, uh, as I said earlier, if the infection is in the late second trimester, you may see a malformation of cortical development. So you can have abnormal early uh, uh, gyral uh, formation, increased uh, 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 gyral formation, or completely lack of sulcation. Uh, so you have the typical flat uh, obtuse uh, uh, sylvian fissure uh, as late as 24 weeks or as early as 20, 22 weeks, you are seeing excessive uh, gyration and periventricular nodular heterotopia and uh, extensive uh, gyral uh, patchy uh, polymicrogyria. And again, the findings may be quite subtle. So here, if you see, there is ventricular megaly, some nodules, and you can appreciate the irregular appearance of the medial margin of the ventricle, which uh, represents periventricular nodular heterotopia. You have asymmetric ventricular megaly, and uh, the frontal horns are normal, but you can appreciate that there are a lot of periventricular nodules and uh, calcific densities. And of course, the typical uh, appearances in the rest of the ventricular system. So all put together, uh, you will get changes which uh, 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 tell you that this is an infection situation. And then, as I said earlier, prognosis uh, depends on what you see on ultrasound. Uh, uh, and of course, on the uh, viral load and the maternal immune status which has been discussed. Uh, what's most important, as Andana said earlier, is the timing of the infection, the ultrasound features. We don't really do a fetal blood analysis. Uh, uh, you can expect a thrombocytopenia, but if, if, if necessary, you can resort to it. But I don't think I've ever done a fetal blood analysis for an infectious situation. Uh, uh, and of course, MRI is very, very important from the prognosis uh, point of view. And Vandana did allude to this factor that infections are transmitted more in the third trimester, but the severity is more in the first trimester. In fact, if the infection occurs after the first trimester, then you can almost be sure that the chances of the fetus getting affected are quite negligible. So in, in particular, you can see in this one paper, uh, no severe uh, case of congenital infection was observed if the maternal infection occurred after 14 weeks of uh, gestation. So it's usually a first trimester which causes severe in involvement of the fetus. So how do we prognosticate? Of course, if there are severe changes like severe IUGR, microcephaly, CNS changes in the form of uh, intracranial hemorrhage, marked ventricular megaly, cortical abnormalities, then the prognosis is poor and you may expect neonatal death. Uh, and especially if the platelet count is very, very poor and the prognosis is dismal in this kind of situation. And as I said, if there is non-CNS involvement and mild to moderate changes, uh, in the form of meconium peritonitis, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, visceromegaly, essentially, uh, the prognosis can be uncertain. It may depend on the follow-up. So you follow up these cases and that may define the prognosis. If CNS changes are appearing later, uh, then of course, and then of course, if whether you're treating these pregnancies, whether they are showing ch uh, changes, this, so the sequelae may depend on the follow-up situation. And again here, that there is a 30% chance of a bad outcome. Now, if it's, if it's in this particular group where uh, there are no clinical signs, normal USG, both brain MRI and normal biomarkers, uh, then we have a good outcome. But here again, there's a small chance of having sensory loss, uh, the hearing loss, uh, neurosensory hearing loss in about 15%. And that uh, needs to be counseled to the, to the parents. So uh, what about abnormal neurosonogram consistent? Uh, uh, the maternal CMB status may be misleading. So we really don't rely on serology when you have abnormal CNS findings uh, on ultrasound. And you don't even need to do an amniocentesis if you have typical signs, as you saw, uh, uh, and you can consider termination straight away. Sometimes if it presents late, then MRI is only used for medical legal purposes or for patient assurance. Uh, if they want an MRI, if, if the findings 
are very subtle, very less. Just for example, if you have just mild ventriculomegaly, then you may need to do an MRI to look for other abnormalities. And of course, if the not in our country, probably because most of these changes we would see late uh, termination of pregnancy needs to be offered. Uh, what's important is that a regular follow-up is very, very important. The moment you are suspecting an infection and no ultrasound changes are seen, uh, you must remember that ultrasound changes can appear late and you need to do a regular follow-up. Uh, we spoke about fetal blood sampling and uh, platelet count, uh, which may suggest a poor prognosis, but I don't think we really need to do this. Uh, the moment we have an amniotic fluid, which is positive, uh, usually we either terminate the pregnancy or treat or look for ultrasound signs of CNS abnormality uh, there. Now, role of MRI, uh, is, is uh, definitely there. It's a complementary role. As I said earlier, uh, it adds to the findings on ultrasound and both put together give a better uh, outcome in terms of accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. But or you're like an expert, like if you see Malinga's paper here, he, he said that dedicated neurosonography is as good as MRI. You don't need MRI. In the diagnosis of MRI for him is reassurance for the patients regarding the presence or absence of uh, 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 abnormalities. Uh, so the addition of MRI to ultrasound uh, increases the positive prediction value, especially in centers which don't have good ultrasound, maybe a good idea. Uh, prognosis, uh, like I said earlier, depends on the presence of fetal brain lesions. Uh, a normal ultrasound of the brain, especially you need to do a targeted neurosonography, a transvaginal ultrasound is the better way of looking, has the best negative predictive value. If the ultrasound done by an expert, especially transvaginally or with high resolution transducers is negative, even if you find subtle abnormalities on MRI, they, they, they should be considered with caution and may not really impact on the outcome. But if you do both, and if you find changes, then the positive predictive value of these modalities put together is almost 100%. So it's a good idea to do ultrasound. Now management, uh, I will not go too much into it because Vandana has very beautifully uh, spoken about management. Uh, and uh, uh, so I will skip a few of these slides. Prevention is important, especially infection can come from children in school. So the, the pregnant women have to be careful when they are dealing with uh, children and maintain proper hygiene. She has already spoken about uh, the drugs in pregnancy, so I won't go into that, except that uh, uh, I think uh, we should look at using these drugs, especially now that we have a lot of pregnancies which want to continue. Uh, so uh, uh, there are reports which say that they are safe for use in pregnancy. The problems, of course, being higher doses, and I, and I hope the panel discussion can address that. And there are no adverse neonatal effects. And I will, I will also not go into hyperimmune globulin. Uh, uh, even vertical transmission can be presented, uh, prevented. And again, I will leave that to uh, the, uh, the panel. But what I'll just round up with is some interesting cases. Uh, this is a toxoplasmosis. This was a 28-year-old uh, with a completely normal first trimester scan. She had fever for two days in the first trimester. Mm -hmm. A normally scan was absolutely normal. And then at 32 weeks, you can see here extensive, uh, this is courtesy Dr. Manju, uh, we saw extensive calcification. You can see even the cor 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 corpus callosum looks almost like a lipoma and a ventricular megaly with severe calcification. And uh, this turned out to be toxoplasmosis. So first trimester, two days of fever, normal anomaly scan, normal uh, 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 first trimester screening and late presentation at 32 weeks. And of course, uh, another fetus here presented at 22 weeks with echogenic uh, lens here, and that is typical of uh, toxo and rubella. This was another fetus which presented with anophthalmia. You can see there's a very, uh, there's no uh, uh, eyeball there. There's only a small orbit and you can see that there is no uh, lens seen, so anophthalmia. Another fetus here with congenital rubella uh, who presented with unilateral small orbit and congenital cataract. The other orbit was normal, and this is sometimes uh, uh, tells us that we need to look at the orbits very carefully, and this was as early as 19 weeks. 
uh, of pregnancy. So it's, it's really, and that's the 3D picture. You can see that one uh, eyeball is prominent and the other eyeball is not seen. So toxoplasmosis, basically uh, a lot of these infections have overlapping uh, manifestations. They are quite uh, overlapping on ultrasound. And uh, uh, the, we do see a lot of extensive, more severe destructive ventricular megaly with toxoplasmosis as compared to CMB. So here again, uh, this was another interesting case of a 32-year-old non-consanguinous marriage. She had a previous fetal high drops not investigated. And in this pregnancy, again, landed up with high drops. No uh, visceromegaly, you can see here. Uh, the MCA Doppler was normal, but there was extensive calcification in the basal ganglia, something like a lenticular stri striate vasculopathy. And so we thought we are dealing with infection. There were other non-CNS findings. Uh, the MCA Doppler was normal, and at 22 to 24 weeks, we started investigating because the fetus presented late uh, with a lot of Doppler findings. The, uh, the amniocentesis PCR was torch negative. So that was uh, quite surprising for us because it was 24 weeks, appropriate time. The fish and microarray was normal. Ascitis was exudated, platelet, platelet was low, 90,000. So we were quite confused. And then we had to do a clinical exam. And this is a differential diagnosis of the torch. It's a pseudo torch syndrome, which can mimic completely the torch. And then we did the parental uh, clinical exam and both are carriers for the ACRD Gautier syndrome. So what is called as the pseudo Torch. Now, parvovirus usually, as uh, uh, Vandana alluded to, is uh, can present in the first trimester with severe high drops, and then the prognosis may be bad. But it can present later with myocarditis. The, the viremia affects the myocardial cells directly, and you can land up with high drops, which is reversible. And uh, in some situations, especially if the high drops has not yet occurred, and if you've just got very mild changes, if you give a transfusion, uh, the changes can be reversible. But what is scary is that in one of the papers I just read was that 50% of the fetuses, even though they were treated uh, and the high drops reverted, the fetuses were delivered normal, they had abnormal CNS manifestations. So that's very, very important that not always things may be hunky-dory. Now, in our country, we have a lot of other infections, and dengue has been a problem. And what we usually see is severe oligohydramnios that manifests. Uh, you may have growth disturbance, and this can be self-limiting, and the pregnancies can do well at a later stage. And finally, I don't have any case of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, but what is seen in literature is that uh, even if the mother does have COVID infections, they should be encouraged for vaginal delivery as uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, babies uh, born with cesarean section were in involved almost 50% more as compared to vaginal delivery. Uh, babies which were not breastfed were affected more, so we must encourage breastfeeding even if, if the mother is COVID positive. And of course, no isolation of the baby. So if the baby was kept in isolation from the mother, uh, then 13% uh, of them got infected, whereas uh, if, if they were kept with the mother, the chances of infection were less. This is obviously due to the uh, effects of uh, uh, breastfeeding, which helped the fetus not get infected. The mortality of these mother is similar to non-pregnant women if they have comorbid situations. And of course, uh, the, the neonates, there's probably been only one or two case reports, but they do have preterm delivery. And that's probably the only thing I can find. So in conclusion, uh, you must have a small clinical index of suspicion. Uh, like I said, keep your eyes open, be familiar with the clusters of stigmata of ultrasound changes. And then you look for changes, which we have already spoken about. I will skip a little bit of this. Uh, fetal ultrasound is essential to the management, both for diagnosis and prognosis. And uh, the site of uh, signs of fetal in, uh, infection can be present in 65% of cases when infection occurs in the first trimester and very less when it occurs later in pregnancy. So ultrasound uh, signs of fetal infection after a negative amniocentesis, you need to do another amniocentesis. This is very, very important. If you are very strongly suspecting, then please 
repeat the amniocentesis because the timing of the amniocentesis may not have been correct. If you've got negative amniocentesis and serology and ultrasound positive, please scan on a monthly basis. If you've got positive amniocentesis, then scan fortnightly. So I thank you for a very patient hearing and giving me this opportunity, Mohit. Uh, I would love to take questions in the end and would love to get yes. into your panel discussion. Yes, thank you so much, sir. You've actually covered every aspect of fetal infections. And thank you so much for taking out the time. It was really a wonderful session. Thank you. And uh, for everyone, uh, I would like to point out that we've got interesting questions in the chat box, but we might be taking up later when we end the program. Um, I want to also tell you that another highlight of uh, this program is going to be the panel discussion. So do hang on for the panel discussions once I introduce the panelists. I would like uh, uh, Conference International to play the sponsorship video now, if you can before we take on, before we introduce the panel. Sumit, can we have our uh, trade partner presentation, please? Oh, God, he comes in the room. Now, on to the panel now. And I can assure everyone this is going to be the most interesting aspect of uh, this program. And may I introduce the moderators of this program, Dr. K. Aparna Sharma and Dr. Anubhuti Rana. They are the assistant professors in obstetric Department of Obstetric and Imaging, Ames Hospital, Delhi. But I can assure you, they've done a marvelous job. And knowing Dr. Aparna Sharma, she is a fantastic moderator and she has an absolute clarity of thoughts. And she is going to take us through this panel discussion along with Dr. Anubhuti Rana. Our panelists, our esteemed panelists are Dr. Ashok Khurana. Uh, we all know him as a past president of SFM, but he has been instrumental in getting SFM where it is today. Dr. Nitin Chobal. He has been the past president of IFVMB. He is the current president of Musculoskeletal Ultrasound Society, uh, Thane chapter of IRI. He is an international figure in ultrasound. And I'm, we are privileged to have both of these preliminaries along with us. Dr. Anu Vij is a senior obstetrician uh, in New Bombay. She has 26 years of clinical obstetrics experience. She has been the past president of Navi Mumbai OB Gynec Society. I welcome you, ma'am. Dr. Alpana Joshi is a senior radiologist from Shoba Diagnostics, Malad. She is the Politburo member of uh, Mumbai chapter of IRI and she has special interest in obstetric ultrasound. Welcome, ma'am. <laughs> Dr. Pooja Wazirani. She is a fetal medicine specialist, one of the first few ones to, uh, for, to come to Mumbai uh, from Mediscan. I remember uh, interacting with her almost eight years back, and she is now a senior fetal medicine consultant in Hiranandani Hospital, Pawai, as well as in Surya Mother and Care Hospital. Dr. Priya Deshpande is a fetal medicine consultant in New Bombay, in the Motherhood Hospital, and in Apollo Hospital, New Bombay. She is also the treasurer of uh, the Society of Fetal Medicine Specialists of Maharashtra. Welcome, Dr. Priya and Dr. Sachin Nichite. Dr. Sachin Nichite is an upcoming fetal medicine specialist who has two fetal medicine centers in New Bombay and also attached to Hiranandani uh, Hospital, Pawai. So uh, over to you, Dr. Aparna Sharma and Dr. Anubhuti Dana. So um, a very good evening to all of you. And I uh, thank Dr. Ashok Khurana and Dr. Mohit and Society of Fetal Medicine for uh, providing me this, this opportunity to be on this platform. Now I have a very eminent group of panelists and I'm uh, really fortunate that 
before us we have had two exquisite talks and i would uh, really i think uh, uh, my panelists would agree with me when i say that you know whatever we are going to say is going to be a reiteration of what the speakers have said but torch being torch needs to be you know repeated and needs to be there is so much of confusion there is so much of you know despite seeing cases years on we still get confused so i think it is time for this panel to reiterate what has been said what has been practiced so that the messages stay loud and clear and from tomorrow we know that when we see a case of igm and igg we don't get confused so i welcome all my panelists i welcome my co moderator dr anubuti and we will take you through very simple questions very simple cases but we do hope that the messages will stay long with you so when we talk about infections in pregnancy so there are three types of infections one are predominantly fetal infections which we are going to talk about then there are certain group of infections which are both fetal and maternal like hiv hps ag and hcv and there are predominantly maternal infections today we are talking about predominantly fetal infections some of them are more common clinically and that is no, no, sorry your screen you are not shared i think still no no it's on we can see the screen the network you need to check okay. yeah it is on sir it is on yeah yeah no yeah. oh sorry yeah yeah it's coming clear yeah okay am Carry i on audible? Yeah. am i audible yes yes right so sir can you uh, i think you need to join again probably your network right so this predominantly fetal infections this is what we have been classically calling as torch infections and this actually torch group of infections keep getting added with new infection so this is what we are going to deal and thankfully before this panel happened this happened this guideline and i'm so thankful for these guidelines because you know they give such clear inputs on what is to be done otherwise there is no end to the literature and we've read you know articles after articles and then ended up thinking that okay this guideline is enough right so let's just go about at a glance we'll be talking about what is the effect of the infection on the fetus what are the indication on torch testing because even in the chat box i think all of us have said that can we just have a summary of what are the indications of torch testing and i think this question has been asked to us again and again at every forum so we will be going to that how to work up maternal infection serology you know just clear points work up of fetal infection and how to prevent and treat infection so let us begin with our first case now this is so all of these cases as have been beautifully illustrated by the previous two speakers just to add on a few more cases i think each of us have had so many experience our own experience of torch cases that however much we speak is never enough but let's just start with some of the cases so a 24 year old primary gravida 28 weeks pregnancy everything else was normal aneuploidy screening negative blood pressure is normal the only finding on ultrasound was a fetal growth restriction there was nothing else and there was associated oligohydramnios so there was fetal growth restriction and oligohydramnios there was nothing else now dr anu i would like to know from you that can this be explained by torch infection and at the same time i would like to know what are the possible effects of torch infection in the fetus now i would like to ask this this has been emphasized a bit but i would like to know that what are the possible effects of torch infection torch group of infections on the fetus ma'am unmute yourself please yeah 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 so i'm going to open um as an obstetrician at the face of it i would like to have little more information like what is the bmi of the patient what was her birth weight was she a small baby when she was delivered and what is the bmi of her husband so if we see that the parents are small stature small built this i would like to categorize as a small for date uh, baby but if these uh, questions are answered in a negative then we have we can have torch at the back of our mind but uh, not as the first diagnosis and coming to the second part of the question the possible effects of torch infection on the fetus uh, again it depends on at what time the infection has been uh, um, 
passed on from the mother to the fetus but usually uh, they can be uh, um, they, they can result in a spontaneous uh, abortion or there can be a low birth weight uh, infant there can be uh, structural anomalies in the fetus preterm uh, birth or there can be stillbirths right so so uh, so this is where we come so uh, dr mitin chobal so this is what people uh, and we would also like to know again and again so what are the indications for maternal screening for torch during pregnancy i think so again and again so if, if there is uh, a simple do you like to do a routine screening or what are the indications for screening for maternal torch so if you like to say you know clear cut messages yeah sure hi good evening all of you so i think uh, madhana touched upon this uh, so as a routine as of today most of the guidelines or most of the societies do not favor doing a routine screening for everyone especially if the ladies are symptomatic or low risk so that's almost like uh, universal but we would definitely think of infection as we have been discussing especially if you have an fgr with a normal doppler or a growth restriction with anything anything else like oligoamnios in this case which you presented or any other signs which chandra has described either cranial or intracranial <coughs> if you see anything of this in the fetus or overall in the pregnancy like like uh, placental changes and there is a doubt then one would definitely start off doing a torch infection uh, besides that of course uh, uh, if the mother has uh, recent history or has come to you uh, with fever rash or lymphadenopathy some neurological hematological dyskinesis again you would think of infection and do that if the mother has been exposed uh, to uh, someone who is either positive or again has a very severe clinical high index of suspicion for tort infection again one would be uh, thinking of doing that and then of course if there is a high risk and sometimes of course you might do a tort if there has been a past history and you would like to know what is the current status of the uh, whether she is still igg positive or what is the current status so these are some indications where we would like to do a tort otherwise as we said by far and large we don't do screening there are some societies or countries where rubella is very often the screening alone so that's right. what so i think rubella very uh, uh, nicely raised that point that uh, you know high risk conditions we screen but and rubella we will come to it because i think that's an important point and i think we need to raise that issue here so as this uh, we just uh, said that uh, you know there might be some high risk groups for torch infection so puja can you tell us which group of women are at high risk like sir said that there could have been some so which are the high risk uh, group of pregnant women at risk for torch infection so pregnant uh, women who are at high risk for torch infections are uh, women who give first of all history of exposure to a, a person who had the torch infection secondly also the it was a study that cmv infections were more common in the gravida 2 where they where the interval between both the pregnancies was less than 2 years so you have toddlers at home you have nursery so that the kind of cmv infection which is the commonest one passes through saliva and urine and kissing of the neonates so that is one aspect toxoplasmosis is again a parasite uh, uh, through uh, the feline uh, origin so eating of uncooked meat raw vegetables or cats in the house uh you are exposed to that moreover uh, areas of africa and brazil where the sanitation is not good contaminated water or unhygienic measures these are the uh, women who are actually a very high risk for torch and therefore their areas which are endemic for some infections like toxo in france and brazil also which is very high risk so overall uh, endemic area uh, exposure to anyone who has and also a uh, history of toddlers and uh, pets at home right so thank you puja for uh, answering that question so the idea of putting it is that although it is not that you know you screen torch in everything in, in every patient so there is some situation that these are the behavior which can be used for prevention of torch infections like you know this has been mentioned before now i like to ask the most controversial questions to dr kurana and i love the way he answers <laughs> so now i come to the most important question of the panel are which are the situations in which you should not 
do a start screening during pregnancy like you know yeah. we i was actually working sir in a hospital where they would do start screening for all pregnant patients i was once upon a time working in one of the places so routine screening so but there are certain situations in which you should not do a start screening during pregnancy and what would be those situations yeah so you know this is uh, not just a biological question this is a political question and what happens is that because women are not important to most governments and because women refuse to press their cause and they press for other causes we get stuck with guidelines which are completely biased towards preventing further expenditure by governments on health and therefore we have the acog guidelines which say don't do it we have the european guidelines which say don't do it in india we are very happy we have no guidelines and yet we completely ignore the fact that at least in india a lot of healthcare is actually out of pocket expenses so there was this most delicious question that we found in the chat box which said um, when i was counseling for echogenic bowel my patient asked me why didn't i do a um, in, uh, a cmv screen when i was given the uh, 18 other tests the question is what are you going to answer her? then you have to tell them right at the beginning of pregnancy that look there is no end to the tests and we have certain guidelines if you are pressed for expenses we will not do those and if you're not pressed for expenses we will not do those alternatively and i really think this is the best way to do it that when we do our first trimester screen we request every single lab to preserve the serum until 9 months from that date so it covers up the neonatal period and you can go back to that serum to assess it in which case we will technically scientifically not do a torch screen otherwise we can hide behind any curtain and that's not fair we know that rubella is not important for foreigners anymore because they've eradicated it but it's certainly important for us even today uh, because we don't have a covered population we also know that uh, we have pockets of zika that have come up so what do we do obviously if i find that someone is sitting right in the middle of midnapore or wherever in in west bengal we having this infection i would naturally have to do a test for zika as well right in the beginning so truly speaking the answer to this question is not biological it is political for people wanting to avoid the responsibility and for us pandering to our patients to say i will spend on weddings and i will even during corona season call 6000 people but i will not spend on my medical care the fact is that infections exist the fact is that these infections as we've heard from our first two speakers have devastating effects on cerebral function and cranial function and uh, neural function etc cetera, etc cetera, and we cannot afford to overlook those and therefore truly speaking there is no question where a maternal complete torch screen uh, should not be thought of yes we try to have, give people value for money that's different but i think it is very important that just as we do for other things you give a menu and say look these are optional they might create controversy would you like to have them or not and not behind hide behind guidelines right so uh, i think that was like uh, really opening a pandora's box but uh, yes so uh, i would also like to mention that probably recurrent pregnancy loss could be one condition where you know we routinely advise uh, torch but because we also know what dr vandana said that uh, recurrent pregnancy loss uh, might not be happening because of torch infection usually and she did show one of the cases where it did happen but that's like really rare so that is one situation where maybe we could not uh routinely think of torch infection so that is one thing so now we come to the next question and i think it has been like really really covered in detail by what is the role of ultrasound in diagnosis of fetal infection so just a really quick re recap uh, dr alpana uh, would you like to just uh, talk about it uh yes so as we saw it has a very important role uh both for diagnosis prognosis for a follow up and for everything especially when sometimes these torch titers in the lab routes can be so confusing so it is a very important sign especially in cases where there are non specific two three findings and we are not very sure uh which category it falls to uh, we uh, usually say that ultrasound findings are suggestive of torch infection and get the patient work up done the signs we have already covered uh, in detail of course uh, uh, already in the topic uh, in the lecture by dr dulla yes 
so i think uh, this ultrasound is like you know uh, our torch infections with ultrasound is one of the very few uh, areas where obstetricians and radiologists have to really work hand in hand uh, correlate the serology with ultrasound so you know one of the true meaning of the sfm or the you know obstetricians and radiologists working together and making a correlation so i think that's the most important aspect of it so again uh, as uh, dr khurana was saying that uh, routine screening for torch uh, the role of actually uh, dr priya would you like to talk about the rubella screening the status of rubella screening uh, what do you would uh, is the current status in your practice do you advise a rubella screening you know again pandora's box but what is the status for you Okay. Uh, f- first of all, hello from my side, and I'm uh, thankful to be invited on this panel. Well, uh, as we have been discussing, that routine screening for infections is not yet recommended, but for rubella, rubella, we know it 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 has uh, major clinical implications, especially when fetal infection is so severe. We should at least elicit the history of past immunization, and also look for IgG because IgG will uh, give us an idea about her immunity, especially. and after that we can carry on forward yeah so uh, at least like uh, dr kurana said so rubella is actually not seen in the western world anymore and that's because of routine prenatal vaccination preconception va- vaccination so un- at least prenatal uh, rubella history as dr priya has rightly said we should think about it and in our preconception clinic that we are actually now starting about thinking about prenatal rubella vaccination is something that we should start thinking about and this is in the offing and as we have adequately discussed that prenatal uh, routine screening for torch maybe not currently but sometime in the future yes maybe but currently we are not routinely screening for torch infection so dr sachin this patient was screened for torch and was found to be surprisingly hsv igg positive right so this is going away from what we have discussed till now so are there any actually clinical implications of this report and i'm sure all of us come across this herpes simplex igg positive so are there any clinical implication of this report coming directly to the answer in this particular case there is no direct implication actually right uh, in contrast to other viral infections in pregnancy hsv has uh, a very very rarely it get transmitted to the fetus the only point where it is transmitted is the uh, during birth the, by contamination with the uh, secretions so right. in this case there is no implication for uh, this report right so this particular case why i started it in the beginning is that you know some of the torch infections even if they are positive don't really have an implication on the immediate pathology of the fetus and uh, this patient uh, was hsv positive and hsv normally causes a neonatal infection at transmission at the time of delivery so uh, something that we really want to know and uh, and and that it does not have um, it, the intrauterine transmission of hsv infection from mother to fetus is really rare so uh, coming on to our next case uh, so i would now request dr anubhuti to take over and uh, talk about the next case very good evening to all of you so the next case is a sent gravida abortion lady with 13 weeks period of gestation and she presented with fever and rash mills for 3 days her antenatal investigations were normal and she had low risk on aneuploidy screening and she comes to your clinic with a report of igm and igg positive for rubella so my first question is to dr anu that what are the usual manifestations of rubella infection in the mother uh usually this presents as an asymptomatic infection but uh, mild flu like illness like fever malle some sort of arthralgia myalgia can be seen lymphadenopathy is also very typical of this especially the suboccipital and the cervical and there can be a maculopapular rash so but usually 50% or more patients are usually asymptomatic thank you ma'am The next question is to Dr. Priya. What are the manifestations of fetal affection of rubella? Well, rubella has severe manifestations, and when the infection happens earlier, it is basically an embryopathy, as we know, and it can uh, cause miscarriages in early pregnancy, and also uh, stillbirth is also one of the re- uh, one of the uh, uh, things which can be seen with rubella syndrome. However, with infants. 
who who are born with uh, the infection of rubella will typically show as the congenital rubella syndrome and that has a spectrum of uh, features including cerebral extra cerebral especially cardiac defects exceptional uh, defects and pulmonary stenosis ocular defects we can see retinopathy microphthalmia and uh, uh, hearing loss so so this is quite a severe uh, manifestation and uh, ultrasound can diagnose all of this uh, with a higher sensitivity almost close to 100% So, uh, my next question is to Doctor Sachin. What are the chances of this fetal infection? Uh, in rubella, basically, the first trimester affection is most dangerous. Uh, as the pregnancy advances, the chances of transmission decreases, and also the the severity of uh, uh, the affection also decreases. So, for for a for a clinician or for a fetal medicine person, the most important timeline is the first. first trimester of pregnancy so very rightly said that in contrast to major viral infections during pregnancy the risk of fetal infection actually decreases with increasing gestational age but it is very important to remember that the infection is more severe in the first trimester itself yes so now dr um, pooja please uh, with her report of igg and ipl positivity what would be your interpretation and how would you like to proceed so this lady actually presents with a fever with rash there is a, a possibility of infection in her uh, and her reports are showing rubella igm and igg positive now the the fallacy with the serological tests is igm can be positive for months and for years and especially not only with rubella it's with cmv and toxo so with igm positive igg positive and a fever with rash i need to know whether this infection is a primary infection in this pregnancy which can call really a, a long list of complications as predicted before because it's less than 13 weeks so the best test to do that is actually the igg avidity now why is that so because igm can be a falsely positive in rubella it persists for long years and igg in this pregnancy and also be due to past infection so to uh, take that uh, doubt out of it there are further tests uh, which are needed and one of them is avidity so uh, dr priya would you like to advise the test has already been discussed or we also like to repeat the test yeah so definitely as uh, stated by dr pooja we would want to further investigate with igg avidity and most importantly because it gives us the time of infection which has happened uh, so timing it to Uh, a low avidity shows us that infection is acute at least within three months, while a high avidity will show us that infection has happened a little prior, prior to three months in this pregnancy. And this is in particular important when we are evaluating in the first trimester, because in the later gestation, then uh, it loses its importance because we'll never know when it has actually happened. And of course, rising titers of IgG when we find IgG positive. Uh, if we repeat uh, titers after two weeks, and if we find significant fourfold increase. that also is a sign of uh, active uh, infection so to just sum up that we are routinely screening for rubella only if there's no history of previous immunity or vaccination and rubella testing is particularly advised if a patient has had contact with rubella or rubella like illness or fetal anomalies and if both igm and igg are negative the woman is considered to be susceptible if only igg is positive then the woman is supposed to have a past infection or maybe prior immunization if both are positive igm and igg then it could be a possible recent infection or reinfection and the first step is to repeat it after 2 to 3 weeks to detect a rise in serum igg or a seal conversion and measure the igg avidity and if only igm is positive then it is also suggestive of possible recent infection if there is no serum conversion and igg remains negative that means that it is false positive igm however if there is igg serum conversion and igg becomes positive then definitely this is a candidate who has a acute rubella infection so we have discussed this in enough detail about recent rubella infection and the most important is serum conversion or a fold for rise in rubella igg antibody with low avidity next question is to dr nitin so how will you confirm the diagnosis of fetal infection i mean the most uh, diagnostic uh, test which has got a very good sensitivity specificity is of course amniocentesis and looking for a pcr the whole problem here is the timing 
I mean, if you have an infection uh, which has come up, say, in the region of uh, 12, because it takes about six weeks for the uh, amniocentesis report, PCR reports to be positive. So typically, if the infection has been in around, say, 12 weeks or 13, 14, we can easily do an amnio around 18 weeks or 20 weeks. And that would be a sort of an ideal thing as far as tests are concerned. But if you have an infection which has you know, come up very early, periconception or in the first trimester, uh, we may not have much time uh, to do an amnio as, as well at that time. So if, if, if everything else is pointing highly towards rubella in the in sense of your blood test, then we might take a, a, a wise decision to maybe even terminate the pregnancy without doing a diagnostic test. And on the other hand, if you have an infection which has come very late, say after 18, 20 weeks, then by the time you have amniotic fluid PCR coming positive, it is going to be another six weeks. So you know by then she will be around 28, whatever weeks. And then we don't know how useful it is going to be as for, from a clinical perspective view. So, uh, I mean, uh, diagnostic is, of course, amniotic twin PCR, but the timing is very, very important. And that you have to judge when, when is the right time to do it, depending upon when she has manifested to us. Yes, exactly. So the timing of the test is very important. So my next question is to Dr. Alp. Now, what is the management of this maternal and fetal infection? Do we have some treatment, some therapy? Uh, drug? Well, nothing. Uh, basically, maternal infections is self-limiting. Uh, just the symptomatic treatment is enough and we know for fetal infections there is no definitive treatment and uh, if you feel that the fetus is affected, if you prove it by the test, uh, well it is better to you know terminate because knowing the uh, manifestations of rubella on a fetus, it is wiser decision to terminate. So no fetal treatment as such is going to be possible. Mr. Uh, Smap, if the woman contracts infection in preconception period, there is generally no risk of congenital infection. But however, the most important period is first 12 weeks, and there is risk of very high rate of fetal infection, very high risk of congenital effect. And we can even offer termination of pregnancy even without an invasive test, which we have discussed. And in 13 to 16 weeks, the risk is still there, and we should consider fetal testing and termination of pregnancy. However, after 17 weeks, the risk of fetal infection is less and the very risk, risk, risk to the min, uh, fetal defects. So only ultrasound surveillance could be useful in these cases and it does not warrant an amniocentesis. And after that, oh, it still has to be followed only by ultrasound. So my last question is to Dr. Ashok. What is the role of vaccination and do hmm. we actually see a possibility <clears throat> of eradication as promised by the WHO in this foreseeable future? Yeah, of course. You know, we have uh, a vaccine and we have a very effective vaccine. And if it's effectively used like it was in the America at the turn of the century, by 2015, we had no rubella left in the United States of America. In fact, in the entire America's region of the WHO as we define it. And the same things happened in Europe that now we have how much? Almost two thirds of the 53 countries of Europe <coughs> excuse me, um, are actually uh, uh, using the infection and they've eradicated the infection. And the same thing has happened in the UK that we now have a herd immunity thanks to the infection to about 99% of their population. And so it's very, very clear that, the, that this is the way forward, that we have to uh, vaccinate our patients. The question is, uh, when do we vaccinate? Of course, we will do the childhood vaccination. And then anybody who is uh, going to get their marriage registered should be forced to do this because it's such a devastating infection and the government should pay for it. But uh, in the absence of that, anybody who comes for preconceptional counseling or premarital counseling, it's a very, very good idea. And we know it works. The question that arises is that is uh, what are the chances that the immunity given by a childhood infection would still be effective, say, years down the line? Um, and the, the question is that, yes, sometimes it may not be, but we have a very simple test. If the IgG to rubella comes negative, then we give a, a revaccination and we're quite happy with it. But truly speaking, this is the way forward. Uh, we have a effective vaccination as part of the MMR um, whenever we do it, or, uh, whenever we give it in childhood and as an independent vaccination uh, later in life. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. And I think uh, that's a very nice answer because, and there's another question that how long that rubella vaccine works. It is for lifelong vaccine. Uh, yeah. so even if you've given in the preconception period or childhood. So as sir said, just do one IT. If you think it's there, you are vaccinated. 
So uh, simple test and 62% of the countries have actually eradicated measles, uh, uh, rubella. So I don't know what we are waiting for. So we, it just needs some more awareness on our part. So if women who are preconceptional, like I said, with the marriage certificate, we have to give rubella vaccine. Brilliant idea, sir. I just love your ideas. And Thank also, you. we have not been able to give it in the antipartum period. We can please give it in the postpartum period for our next pregnancy. It is still safe in breastfeeding. So anytime we have to take rubella out of this uh, uh, infection in India. So, uh, may I add uh, one thing? Excuse yes. me. Uh, just a small uh, point. Uh, if we have given vaccination to the patient and if she inadvertently gets pregnant in the first one or two months, that is not an indication for MTP. So we can safely tell her to continue the pregnancy. Very, very important point that if she has been vaccinated and she has accidentally conceived, there is no need to terminate that pregnancy because it's an uh, inactivated vaccine and it does not cause teratogenicity. So that's very important. And in fact, the, uh, the gap between vaccination and pregnancy has been reduced from three months to one month. one month. So that's also very important because initially it was three months and now it's one month. So even those women who are waiting for IVF, they don't have to wait for three months after a rubella vaccine to start their IVF cycle. So that's another very important point. So, so now we come to the end of the second case and let's start with the third case. So this, this uh, lady is a 24 year old lady, second gravida para one live one at 33 weeks of gestation with history of fever and myalgia two to three weeks back. And when she came, uh, she showed, uh, had uh, ascites and uh, polyhydramnios. ICP was uh, negative, normal uh, middle cerebral artery peak systolic velocity. So that means she did not have any fetal anemia. Uh, and we did a torch and her toxoplasma IgM and IgG became positive. So, so starting with you again. So is this report relevant? So we all know that France is known for toxoplasmosis, right? So how yes, but the prevalence uh, of toxoplasmosis in India? Is it a real problem in India? So what of about course there is. Uh, we, we had this absolutely fantastic paper, which was from a mixed a North Indian cohort, uh, mixed both in terms of socioeconomic groups as well as where they came from, because it's a group from Delhi. And we know that our good friend Sarman Singh from All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences published this in Tropical Parasitology 2016. And he said that we have an estimated number of 3.8, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 3.8 lakhs per year, which is a huge number of toxoplasmosis coming in. Um, obviously, there are not that a lot of us are exposed <coughs> to cats, but the fact is that there's a lot of us that are exposed to poor hygiene, and that's exactly where it's coming from. And therefore, you really have to be careful. And let's not forget, we are a nation of mice and rats, and therefore, there are bound to be lots of cats. And you never know which part of the kitchen they walk right through. And so we cannot deny the existence of this infection. It's just that we refuse to accept it. And um, that's because we don't, we never used to keep cats, but now it's high fashion to keep cats. <laughs> Right. So thank you, sir. So and I think uh, Dr. Salman Singh's lab was the first lab I heard when I joined AIMS and he's actually established the toxoplasmosis reference laboratory in AIMS uh, in India. So uh, I think uh, we have a very large prevalence and he keeps insisting that, you know, this is a big problem. This is a big problem. And uh, we need to be uh, more aware about it. So um, so this mother gives a history of fever with myalgia for two to three ba uh, weeks back. So Dr. Anu. So what is the usual presentation in the mother uh, of toxoplasmosis? So what is the usual presentation? And do you think that this episode of toxoplasmosis uh, could attribute to these fetal findings? Yeah, as with other infections, the most of the time it is asymptomatic. Around 80% of the time, patients don't show any symptoms. But uh, it usually presents as fever with uh, low grade, which is low grade, with malaise. Headache is there. There can be lymphadenopathy. And since this lady had fever with myalgia and she's testing positive for IgG, IgM, Toxo, there are chances that this fever could be because of Toxo. Right. So uh, I think so. this uh, fetal ultrasound uh, shows ascites in the absence of anemia. So what are the usual features? So could it be attributed to toxoplasmosis? And what are the usual fetal and neonatal manifestations of congenital toxoplasmosis? Dr. Anu, if you could just continue with that. Uh, usually, these are not the typical features, uh, ultrasound uh, features of Toxo. Uh, what we generally see is the 
if you see the there are intracranial features like microcephaly they can be ventriculomegaly they can be hydrocephalus then extracranial there can be hepatosplenomegaly hepatic calcifications ascites they can be pericardial effusions or the pleural effusions um chorioretinitis very difficult to diagnose you have to be dr chandrarula to see it then there can be developmental delay epilepsy blindness in the neonate plus in the neonate itself there can be hepatosplenomegaly anemia there can be rash jaundice and pneumonitis but most of the times these infected infants do not have clinical signs at birth and up to 90% will develop sequelae later on in life right So I think I would agree that you have to be Dr. Chandalula to see that amazing images that he actually showed. So you really have to be really particular and you know looking for them to see those images really. And uh, as in the other case that they showed, uh, Dr. Vandana, that initially they were asymptomatic, later on developed symptoms. So that's a typical finding that initially they would be asymptomatic, later on developed symptoms. So everything which is hunky dory at birth may not be so. So it, they might develop symptoms later on. So this patient is currently in her third. Uh, trimester with a possible fetal infection so i have always been con uh, you know confused as a post graduate you know what happens to first trimester infection what happens to third trimester infection so uh, dr priya could you just uh, you know uh, make us revise once again which trimester how much infection what is more risky fetal affection versus infection so there is this concept of uh, risk of infection versus fetal affection this is a very major concept when we try to understand fetal infection that the risk of infection in which trimester versus fetal affection these are two different things that really need to be understood yeah so the overall risk of uh, infection of the fetus that is vertical transmission in case of toxoplasmosis is as high as 20 to 50% but uh, as we know as the gestation advances the risk of vertical transmission goes on increasing as we see the numbers from 6% in the first trimester to as high as 70% that is the infection is going to be transmitted to the fetus with a higher incidence however the chances of fetal affection are maximum when the infection happens in the first trimester in particular the periconceptional period and uh, in the first trimester of pregnancy so uh, this is uh, true for toxo as well as for cmv but just opposite for uh, rubella because in rubella everything is important in the first trimester yeah so dr priya i think brilliant Uh, this point is very important so for toxo and cmv it's all placental volume dependent so more bigger the placenta more the infection to the fetus so the infection yeah. passes on to the fetus more in the third trimester but the severity of infection is obviously more in the first trimester because the fetus is being formed but in rubella everything is more in the first trimester because obviously it's a teratogenic virus so this is a basic understanding that we need to have regarding torch infections so Now my next question to Dr. Sachin is: Her serology shows IgM and IgG positive. So again, the same thing about IgM and IgG positive. So how would you interpret this report and diagnose the maternal toxoplasmosis? Uh, actually, in the given scenario with the polyamnios and the fetal ascites with IgM and IgG positive, uh, mostly my diagnosis is very certain that she has a recent or active toxoplasma in infection. but still i would like to take help of avidity everybody talks about avidity avidity so in this case definitely i will take uh, help of avidity and come to my conclu conclusion right so dr sachin has uh, you know as as they uh, i would say conventionally pass the buck to avidity so dr priya so uh, can we just have this uh, is this not the question for you so dr pooja sorry uh, is there role of avidity testing in this case so uh, there is this thing only thing that i would like to mention about toxoplasmosis as compared to other infection is that the testing for toxoplasmosis is not as standardized as for other uh, antibodies so as while we consider cmv while we consider rubella it is easier more standardized but for toxoplasmosis the the uh, serology is most confusing so we need to understand where are the standard laboratories in your area in your country so it is very important to find a reference laboratory not every laboratory can do a toxoplasmosis testing and this is what we need to understand when we are under trying to understand serology in toxoplasmosis so dr pooja is there a role of uh, what is the role of avidity testing in this case 
So this case is actually 33 weeks with fetal signs of infection. Now, as Dr. Kurana uh, rightly says that in India, we don't have this policy of a booking sample. Now, usually when you have such infections in 33 weeks, what the other people or the people who have a large load of toxoplasmosis go back to the booking sample, see if this lady was IgM and IgG positive at that time, then this is maybe just a past uh, infection. But if that time she was zero negative and there's a zero conversion, then it gives a high a bracket raised antennas for toxoplasmosis in this pregnancy. Moreover, avidity in toxoplasmosis is not that great. It is the IgG kinetics which play a major role. That is, if you repeat the IgG titers above two to three weeks, there should be a doubling or a fourfold rise. This is more important in toxo rather than avidity. And more so, avidity only gives you backdate of an infection, which is more than three months. Now, three months will be 12 weeks. At 33 weeks, even if this lady is coming to me, you minus 12 weeks from that, it is in the mid-trimester. So definitely avidity is of no help in the later gestation. It is more the kinetics and definitely diagnostic fetal testing in this case. Yeah, I think, uh, Pooja, that was brilliant because you told us two things. That if we can save the serum in the first trimester and say that there is a zero conversion in this pregnancy, that means that there is active infection. That is point number one. Point number two is that avidity is 33 weeks. Even if it is high, it doesn't mean anything because there could have been a first trimester infection. So two very important messages that you said, that you told, and those are the things that will help us decide the management. Now, so the, if you want to summarize, so if the IgM is positive and IgG is negative, then we need to repeat after two weeks. If the IgM is still positive and IgG is still negative, that means that it is false positive false. because there is no zero conversion. So IgM may be false positive. But after two weeks, if the IgG has become positive, that means there has been a zero conversion. You will still need to confirm it from a reference laboratory. Be careful. I mean, there is a strong possibility of fetal infection and fetal affection. That is a, uh, because this is a maternal infection. So please con confirm with a reference lab. So IgM positive, IgG positive, like in this case, confirm from a reference lab. In the third scenario, if the IgM is negative and only IgG is positive, now it might have been an acute infection and now it has become negative. What do you do? The avidity, as Pooja said, even if it is high, it could have been a, 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 a early infection. So if in the first and second trimester, it is possible that it was a pre-pregnancy infection. But in the third trimester, it is difficult to infect, interpret and you would still need a further confirmation of a fetal infection. So this is a summary of the uh, interpretation of the torch. The reference laboratory that you sent the sample to said that the avidity is low. Thankfully for you, there is no more confusion and the avidity was low. So it's a recent infection. So how do you uh, now establish the uh, fetal infection and Dr. Uh, Nitin uh, Chobal, can we just come to you and uh, can you summarize uh, the ultrasound in toxoplasmosis? So once the fetus is affected and you see uh, actual manifestation of ultrasound, by, by then usually it is very late because it's, it's already an affected fetus. So classically in toxo, uh, we have CNS findings which are very uh, often gross. We have ventricular megaly, we have hydrocephalus. Uh, the difference between the two is that in hydrocephalus we have an obstructive pattern very often with raised tensions and this can be because of so many reasons including ac secondary aqueductal stenosis also or it can be a communicating sort of an hydrocephalus because of basal adhesions uh, we can have bleeds we can have calcification as in a sequelae of all that we can have ecogenic areas uh, we can have this uh, odd combination of ventricular megaly with microcephaly which you know like we have on one hand, dilated ventricles, but the whole head is down because of the cerebral atrophy. Then, of course, we can have hepatosplenomegaly, growth restriction, ascites, hydrops, cataract, etc. So, uh, these are the common things which we might see on ultrasound as such in toxo. Just a word about uh, rubella, I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, Anu, I mean, we discussed those uh, findings of rubella, but on ultrasound, we hardly see, I mean, we don't see a lot of them, unlike Toxo and CMB, you know. And we have had cases where, uh, where we had nothing else except maybe short long bones and all. So rubella on ultrasound can be very tricky. Of course, we'll look at the end scene. So as opposed to Toxo and CMB, when if the fetus is affected, very often we see findings which are very 
gross and easy to pick up as such. Right. So thank you for raising that point because you know rubella we generally terminate by first trimester and by the time you know if it's the infection is in second trimester maybe we need to follow by ultrasound and it might not actually show such florid signs. And like Dr. Vandana showed that case that all that she had was uh, you know FGR and it turned out to be congenital rubella syndrome later on. So maybe that's tricky and that's a very valid point. So what is the role of amniocentesis? And we understand that fetal infection can be diagnosed by DNA PCR. But again, as we have to understand that by the time the fetal infection, maternal infection actually reaches the fetus and it is excreted in the uh, and it needs to be, uh, uh, by the time that amniotic fluid PCR can be positive, there has to be a gap of at least four weeks. So amniocentesis needs to be done. And the sensitivity is around 90%, less than 90%. And that there could be false negative results also because of the low levels of uh, toxoplasma DNA if we do the amniocentesis earlier. Now, if the amniocentesis comes negative, is there a role of follow-up following this? So, Dr. Alpna? Uh, yes. In fact, in toxoplasma, the role of ultrasound is very important even if the amniocentesis is negative because, as you rightly said, it is the 90% uh, pickup uh, rate. So, it is still needed, of course, one, to assure the parents that if the ultrasound and MRI is normal, the fetus is less likely to be affected. And even if the amniocentesis is negative, sometimes there may be the signs on ultrasound as the fetus may still be affected. And especially for uh, this particular disease, the manifestations of that PCR in the amniotic fluid can be as late as, in fact, 20 weeks. In fact, there are reports that on an average, it takes around six to eight weeks. But sometimes this PCR becomes positive. I mean, the manifestations can come up as late as 20 weeks after the infection also. So that's why it is very important uh, to do the ultrasound and MRI still, even if the amniocentesis yeah, so the is the role of radiologists doesn't, radiologists and the fetal medicine person doesn't end with amniocentesis. We still need to keep following need to do it. And uh, follow-ups uh, are important. Yeah, so now that the amniocentesis has come to be positive, so now we come to the part where the ball is again in the court of the treating physician or the uh, so what is the treatment which is available? And, you know, this is one of the rare infections where treatment is actually available. So, Prana, sir, what is the treatment that would be given? Uh, while we're waiting for the results, of course, we'll, we'll cover with spirovicin. But now that we have a confirmation, then we know that we have a very specific uh, a drug treatment for it. It's not a single drug treatment. This is one of the first few uh, that emerged as a com combination treatment with, uh, uh, with pyrimethamine and with, um, uh, with uh, sulfadiazine and folinic acid. The only variation on those is really whether you give the folinic acid as a uh, 50 milligram weekly or a 10 to 20 milligrams per day. Otherwise, uh, the spiromycin, of course, you will stop uh, once you finish the week and you've got the results. And the pyrimethamine, as you've indicated, is 50 milligrams once a day. And the sulfadiazine is one gram three times a day. And you keep treating this throughout pregnancy and you ensure that the treatment does not stop after the baby is born. And, and although uh, most societies tell us that it's one year, a lot of societies are now beginning to believe that two years might be a better idea to carry this on, because technically speaking, these are very, very safe drugs. Right. So, uh, and also some people also say that, you know, this combination of pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine may be actually better even for maternal treatment as compared to spiromycin. Sure. But in the first semester, it is not given and it can be given after. Uh, so there are a few trials which have said that this might be a better treatment than spiromycin for, even for maternal treatment. Yeah. So uh, this baby was treated, this mother was treated and then once the infection was confirmed that she was started and the baby girl was also started on uh, treatment for one year and the outcome was good. So with that, uh, there is one uh, interesting question in the chat box that, sir, I would uh, like to take that if a patient comes to us in the second or a third trimester and she gives the history of fever in the first trimester, should we screen her for TOTS now? Yeah. Uh, the question is that, of course, if we have a booking sample, we're very, very comfortable. And we say, OK, we will use this in case you want to be reassured. The second thing is we have to tell her that, look, even if we find an infection, we may not be able to do anything about it. We can prognosticate to a certain extent, but we can't give you straightforward answers. So you have to be ready for that, that there is no treatment. And the third thing is that, yes, you ask her some more details. For instance, if she had a classical non-vesicular rash, 
then we'll say, okay, it could have been um, uh, uh, a, a nice, wonderful, good old uh, rubella, and then we're, we're okay. And if, if she has that typical slap across, then we would uh, again investigate accordingly. The rest of it really would de depend on, did this fever happen after you came back from South America? It could be Zika, or you came back from Bengal, it could be Zika, and, and situations like that, but not otherwise. You would just say that, look, it's inevitable. We have to accept destiny and we can't predict everything and we cannot modify the course of this pregnancy and you have to accept that the way it is. And also, the, our uh, very important MTP Act does come into play that even if your baby is affected, will we be able to terminate your pregnancy? Truly, yes. So what do we do uh, even if the baby is affected and maybe we could just follow you up with ultrasounds and see if there is a fetal affection. I mean, that's the best we can offer. I mean, that's the best. That's true. And then the question will then arise, uh, do I do ultrasound at two weeks, four weeks, six weeks? Um, and, and the question then says, okay, uh, we know that uh, four weeks would be quite all right. But the one ultrasound that I would definitely like to do if I'm really looking for something is a pre-delivery ninth month ultrasound scan and MRI if indicated, because, uh, you know, then the correlation is far better that this was an ultrasound finding before, and you don't have to sit and look for it after the baby is born. We know that the prognosis would be poor and that early, fetal, uh, early infant intervention would be required. And the other I thing is when we're looking for MRI, we must understand that a postnatal MRI involves anesthesia and is a very elaborate procedure. Whereas an antenatal MRI done by a very sensible person who knows about fetal MRI will give you a much better yield. So for prognosticating at about 36 weeks, I would run an MRI just because, or 37 weeks, um, just because I don't want to run a postnatal MRI. Right, sir. So I think uh, that uh, excellent points that you have told. And also we know that in torch infection, there is, if there is no cerebral involvement, the prognosis generally remains good. So I think the MRI is a very good tool to actually, you know, screen out even if the patient is very anxious. So uh, coming with that, we come to the fourth case. And I must say that this has been, you know, a real chance that it has happened that the day I was asked to do this panel, the very next day, this patient turned up. So this, she was, she presented to us at 33 weeks. So I must say that I don't yet know the outcome of this patient, but I was too tempted to present this case. So she presented at 33 weeks with a combined screen low risk and an mm -hmm. optimal scan was normal routine antenatal follow-up with a ventricular megaly and uh, uh, with periventricular cyst, dilated third ventricle, MRI showed uh, dilatation of the occipital horn and lateral ventricles and also periventricular cystic areas with ganglio-capsular regions sensitive of uh, uh, gliosis and uh, partial callosal agenesis. Uh, so, and then uh, she is positive and CMV avidity is high and she is 33 weeks. So as Pooja just said that even if at 33 weeks the avidity is high, what do you do? You cannot rule out an infection. So just to open the Pandora's box again, I put this case that, okay, I have something to do with CMV and this patient has come just now. So I would like to take this up as a case for CMV. So uh, starting this with uh, Dr. Anu again, Madam, uh, what is the magnitude of CMV infection and why should we be worried about this infection? Because I know that, you know, this is something that we really need to think about. Uh, see, we are concerned about this infection because it's the most common viral cause of congenital infections. And the burden of uh, over our country is around 0.2 to 2% of all the live births. The most important thing about this infection is that it is the only non-genetic cause of sensory neural hearing loss and also neurological disabilities. And uh, usually about a quarter of the infected children do have long-term impairments. And we should be really concerned about this. Apo um, among the infected children around, we, we see around 10 to 15 percent who are symptomatic at birth. So it is uh, sort of a great burden on the obstetric and the fetal medicine uh, specialist to diagnose it Sam early. Right, Sam. So thank you. I think this is something that we really need to keep in mind, and especially when you have a uh, 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 a patient who's coming with an ultrasound suggestive or an MRI. So, uh, Dr. Priya, so what are the, again, factors which influence the degree of fetal affection? So we have discussed this, but because CMV is so common and because the affection is so common, so what are the factors which influence the degree of fetal affection in pregnancy? Yeah. 
So as we know, CMV is the leading cause of infection uh, in pregnancy. The most important thing which we have to find out is whether the infection which has happened is primary or it is non-primary. Now, why is it so? Because uh, in cases of primary infection, the chances of uh, fetal affection and infection are as high as 30 to 40 percent, as opposed to non-primary being just one to two percent. Now, what is primary infection? That's the infection which happens in in the pregnancy for the first time. However, non-primary is something which in which uh, previous infection is either reactivated or the lady is reinfected with a different strain of CMA, uh, CMV virus. So this is extremely important. This we have to differentiate. Secondly, and as we've been discussing, uh, the timing of preg uh, infection in pregnancy is obviously important. And uh, first trimester infection and uh, see the chances of first trimester infection may be less, but chances of affection of the fetus when it is infected in the first trimester is definitely high and we lead to severe long-term sequelae like uh, hearing loss and neurodevelopmental uh, disabilities. So these are the major two uh, factors affecting uh, the fetal affection. Right. So Dr. Pooja, so again, this, like you've already mentioned, so this case, like you said for Toxoda, but this happened for this, that she's IgM negative and IgG positive. So how do you conclusively diagnose maternal CMV infection? So this is a 33 week. So we go by the case and she's IgM negative, IgG positive. Now IgM can be uh, there persists in the blood for months, for days and for years also in CMV. So you don't know whether this lady is actually uh, infection in early in pregnancy, whether IgM has uh, gone down and the IgG has come up or it's this is the IgG which is coming from a past infection. So again, avidity may be useful if such a case presents to you early in pregnancy that is less than uh, 16 weeks or 14 weeks. But if it's a later gestation, avidity may not be of help. It may just tell you that it is a recent infection. If the avidity is less than 30%, it is less than three months. If the avidity is high, that is more than 60%, it is again more than three months. But again, three months is actually practically 12 weeks. So in this case, avidity again may not help because it's a late trimester. What would help is the clinical sign. So in CMV, the main factor for assessing a maternal infection is ultrasound. We don't find really a exposure history when these women come. So the, the modality of investigating CMV is retrospective. That you get an ultrasound finding and you go and investigate the mother. However, with these kind of findings, which the, this baby is showing, definitely there is a high chance of infection. Now in the panel, if CMV IgG is positive, definitely the PCR will give us more answers. And the prognostication will definitely on ultrasound, it is quite severe and abnormality. So that will help in prognosticating rather than serology. So serology may not be useful in such cases. It is more of a diagnostic testing on the fetus, which will tell us about uh, the affection of the fetus. If it is already affected, the, right. yeah, the prognostication and confirming our diagnosis, basically. Right. So, uh, so Dr. Nitin, uh, what would be the ultrasound? So uh, we have discussed this, but could you just summarize the ultrasound findings suggestive of CMV infections? So what Pooja said, of course, uh, ultrasound is good. But one thing we need to remember is by the time you see ultrasound features, that means fetus is affected and you have ultrasound features, it may be late. It can be as late as six to eight weeks, which is a very important thing to remember. So ultrasound wise, we might see anything. We might have just FGR, a very odd combination of FGR with polyhydramnios, oligoplacental calcifications. Then of course, uh, as Chandra showed a lot of CNS findings, typically intraventricular adhesions, uh, periventricular calcification, uh, uh, then of course, periventricular cysts as, as in your case, uh, cortical malformations, uh, corpus callosum typically, uh, I mean, uh, dysgenesis, or rather you can have a partial lesionism of corpus callosum, which is very, which depends upon what stage the infection has affected the fetus, which is very important. And then of course, we can have hepatomegaly, more commonly liver calcifications, ecogenic bowel, ecogenic kidneys. We have had uh, 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 CMV presenting with only ecogenic kidneys and polyhydramnios, so very odd sort of a combination, but uh, we just investigated uh, for ecogenic kidneys. So ecogenic bowel, of course, we see commonly but in practice, I mean, most of the ecogenic bowels which we see, though we investigate for this, depending upon the situation, are usually because of some swallowed blood. So though it's a manifestation of CMV, we need to keep that in mind that it is not commonly in day-to-day -day practice, it doesn't happen. And then of course, ascites, etc. So, I mean, we do have florid features in CMV once the fetus is affected and you, you see the 
organs being affected but it can be late by the time you see ultrasound features which we need to right. keep in mind so uh, so for this patient i've done an amniocentesis today itself so i'm still awaiting the results so uh, the role of amniocentesis uh, in uh, dr alpana uh, and when should you do the amniocentesis i think that's one very important thing for every fetal infection uh, that we have talked about but again a reinforcing that it's very important dr alpana correct so the timing of amniocentesis of course is very important uh, eight weeks uh, at least should pass uh, after the maternal infection and there should be enough of that virus uh, excreted in the urine and that's why it should be done at least say around after 18 weeks so in 19 to 20 weeks of gestation so that you will get enough uh, viral load in that amniotic fluid but again especially when we see these subtle and non specific findings on ultrasound and then there are some equivocal reports on uh, the torch titer and if you're suspecting cmv Uh, and there is a subtle finding or just an echogenic bowel and then you want to rule out the infection because then telling the mother that if the amniotic fluid is not showing cmv uh, the prognostication and the counseling becomes uh, much more easier so amniocentesis will definitely play a role but the timing of amniocentesis uh, should be kept in mind and then the patient should be counseled properly uh, regarding that right so thank you so dr nitin could you take this question on role of mri you know or in diagnosis so you need to unmute yourself so the beginner ashok said uh, you know that you know well done ultrasound is better than mr and that is what malinga says but definitely there are two three areas where mr is going to score one is when you have associated uh, suspected cortical malformations like lesencephaly and that group and second is of course looking at a corpus callosum so uh, definitely because uh, uh, cmv has so much of crs malformations it definitely is a complementary tool to ultrasound and uh, one would like to do it typically after 30 weeks of gestation it will definitely add something more uh, though management wise of course they are not going to it's not going to make much of a difference the prognostic wise it might make a difference right sir so i think that's very important and as doctor as uh, emphasized again so it, they are both complementary and if it is like subtle findings it actually rules out a severe infection so prognostication uh, is prognostication is uh, helped by mri so coming uh, to this question about prenatal prognostic indicators dr khurana could you take this uh, question on what are the prenatal prognostic indicators yes we we've already heard that uh, gestation age is important and first trimester infections are more severe in affecting the fetus and therefore sensory neural hearing loss and cns disabilities are much more when there is infection uh, in early pregnancy um we do understand of course that um the placenta serves not only as a reservoir for infection but also a um a, a sort of barrier for infection so that sometimes can mean that we do not pick up a lot of these findings because the amount of uh, virus getting across was very little but the fetal abnormalities are truly very very useful in prognosticating and the ones that are really useful are the cns findings so the cns findings are very important so if you have a clean uh, ultrasound scan and an mri a clean mri and then as you said a 95% sensitivity is uh, uh, for a excellent outcome the remaining 5% can also be narrowed down by depending on the laboratory findings uh, to a certain extent and there have been to some extent uh, the role of actually trying to find out the viral role uh, the viral load uh, in the fetus by cordocentesis but that's not a very practical thing to do nor is it very standardized so thrombocytopenia in the fetus or a um, uh, the the cmv uh, igm or thrombocytopenia are not very specific but looking back at the avidity can help uh, tremendously on the other hand if you have subtle mri findings uh, which are not very severe when you're looking at the later part of pregnancy then again you have a pretty decent outlook as well it's only when you have gross findings especially the encephalomalacic findings uh, and the calcification that's when you really run into trouble as well as uh, synecy within the ventricles that's when you really run into trouble and of course severe ventriculomegaly the other thing is that typically if i were to do a 28 and a 32 week scan in this as part of the four weekly follow up and i'm clear on this then um, i'm not comfortable or not comfortable however if i do find the findings 
in the CNS, then I know that the possibility of a sensory neural hearing loss or of a neurologic deficit is going to be fairly high if I have an MRI finding uh, or an ultrasound finding. And um, the MRI in this case is far more important for prognostication. So a very good value if we have everything clear, but not such value if we have everything affected. Right, sir. So I think uh, ruling out is more easy than ruling in. Yes. I think that's that's the message. So uh, the next question would be, is there any treatment available for fetal CMV infection? So I just want to say that, you know, uh, this thing has been given by ISWA guideline that asymptomatic fetuses are classified as when there are no abnormality, mild to moderate symptomatic when there are some biological abnormality without brain abnormality on ultrasound, without brain abnormality on ultrasound are classified as mild to moderately symptomatic. And if there are brain abnormalities, then it is a severely symptomatic fetus. So, uh, Dr. Sachin, is there any treatment available for fetal CMV infection? And how can you decide uh, to start treatment? Now, one, uh, this is a very important question which has come on into my part, basically. So, there are two parts. I, I, I would like to simplify for the audience. There are two parts to this question. One is the treatment and in which cases the treatment should be given. So, previously, gancyclovir was the treatment uh, which was given in neonatal uh, CMVs. Uh, they, they were being used for a fetal CMV also. But recently, velocyclovir is a, is upcoming and a newer modality which is being used. Uh, around 8 grams higher doses per day uh, to be given for the fetus. Now I come to the second part. Uh, as you have mentioned that symptomatic, asymptomatic and moderately symptomatic. So the basic crux is uh, ki after giving treatment, mere haath mein kya milne wala hai? that is the crux for the treatment. If the fetus is obviously damaged, if, if the brain is obviously damaged in cases of cavitations, severe ventriculomegaly, severe microcephaly, in these cases, I know I'm not going to get anything in my hand after delivery. So I would not like to give treatment in these cases. In other contrast, asymptomatic means absolutely no findings on ultrasound on MRI. So in these fetuses, I would not like to give treatment. I would like to monitor. Only prerequisite is I would repeat the ultrasounds every two to three weeks so that even any developing abnormalities, then I will start the treatment. Now remains the middle group where there are isolated findings. This is a very important word. Isolated findings, chota mota calcifications, mild ventriculomegaly. These cases are a good, these are the good candidates for the treatment. I would like to give treatment for these cases to get a good outcome. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sachin. I think you explained it very beautifully that asymptomatic and severe chhod dete, kuch nahi karte. And yes. while mild to moderate, maybe we can try. So this this two only two studies have yet given, and those have been given in high dose uh, valacyclovir. So so I think this should be given not very easily. It should be given in places where you know you can monitor and you know, so with caution. So there is an option, there is treatment, but much needs to be done about it right now. Yes. yes. So now we come to the end of it. But before we end, we have just two more slides. So for the first, this is a rapid fire. So I would request Dr. Pooja to answer these questions. So she is a 30-year-old primary gravida, 26, year, 26 weeks POG. With blood group is A positive, ICT negative. Antenatal investigations are normal. However, ultrasound shows fetal hydrox and MCA PSV is raised. Fetal echo is normal. So the idea of these questions is that I'm sure you already know what I'm talking about is parvovirus. But what I want to ask is which intrauterine infection would you implicate as a cause of fetal anemia? Parvovirus B19 is fun, but CMV cases also can have fetal anemia. So I will not exclude that. Right. So if IgM and IgG is positive, my question is what would you do next? amniocentesis or ultrasound for Doppler for fetal anemia and why? So in this case, already uh, the baby is anemic. So are we discussing? So in this case, already the Doppler has been done, the baby is anemic. And then definitely if it's uh, complementing with the IgM and IgG positive for parvovirus B19, I would proceed ahead with diagnostic uh, diagnostic okay. investigations Let for the fetus. Modify the question a bit, right? Okay. So suppose in this case, there was no anemia and she turned out to be parvovirus positive and there was no fetal anemia yes, as yet. So to confirm a maternal infection, do you actually want to uh, do an amniocentesis to confirm a fetal infection? First, I will do uh, any hydrops, fetal hydrops, where there is no RH uh, negative mother. 
definitely you have to put your dopplers on to find out whether the hydrops is due to fetal anemia or due to other causes if it's due to fetal anemia then the investigation parameters will also drive towards infection and that uh, will again lead to uh, parvo and cmv testing so then uh, then we go ahead with which comes positive right so what is the monitoring schedule for uh, for a mother who's having parvo virus infection so parvo virus infection actually over the period of 7 7 weeks can be self limiting but when it's really affecting about 25 to 30% of the fetuses can affect get affected with parvo virus the 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 thing is it's not teratogenic it leads to uh, fetal anemia because of its erythrocyte uh, you know a more uh, going towards rbc destruction so the monitoring even if it's uh, the fetus is normal in the first instance there is a two weekly monitoring up to 12 weeks because the signs of fetal anemia or the implications of parvo can go beyond 12 weeks also so a strict monitoring protocol every two weekly specifically to see for any signs of early hydrops or mca uh, psp going beyond 1.5 mom right and the indications would be hydrops like in this case or an mca psp more than one so the Even only thing about parvo virus that i would like to emphasize again as pooja said is that it's not a teratogenic virus like the other viruses that we have discussed so the only thing that we need to worry about is anemia however in the guidelines also it has been mentioned that it could the hydrops and the consequent heart failure and the prolonged hypoxia could result in cerebral abnormality right. so later on if you had her chronic fetal uh, hydrops and heart failure so there is a role of ultrasound follow up and mri to look for other changes so this yep. is all about parvo what that i would talk about and now i request dr khurana to answer a few questions for me so 32 year old primary gravida 16 weeks fever with pruritic vesicular rash chicken pox clinical diagnosis so what is the risk of fetal affection the risk of fetal affection is usually low but not zero and you truly have to be careful and counsel them accordingly and of course you have to tell them that look i will monitor this with an ultrasound and with some degree of investigation but i may not see the effect uh, till about 5 weeks after infection so if you have early pregnancy uh, first trimester about 0.5% the second uh, one before the, the the early part of the second trimester about 2% and beyond 20 weeks a minimal infection except of course at term where you have a neonatal infection so how do you diagnose fetal infection well you see the fact is uh, in terms of fetal affection uh, that is you are not going to know whether the fetus was infected and therefore got affected and then if the fetus got affected what was the degree of affection and sometimes you're lucky that you find things like uh, you know limb defects or you will find something like a micro microphthalmia uh, sometimes even uh, you know uh, the fact that there is a lymphoresis while you're watching and there are absent fetal movements but the vast majority of times you will if you really want to confirm it need to do an amniocentesis and pcr right sir so the third point is that is there a treatment which is available which yeah. you would like to give to the mother yeah so uh, in in terms of uh, the treatment we do have it and if the if the mother at that moment in time is non immune then we could think of a varicella zoster immune globulin Uh, otherwise you offer her oral uh, acyclovir and within 24 hours of the rash when she gets this and that will reduce the chances of affection of the fetus and then of course the uh, option of um, of uh, termination of pregnancy in case she's terrified of any such thing right so if a mother has chicken pox the chances yeah. of fetus having chicken pox is, uh, sorry is getting affected is only when the affection is in the early pregnancy later yes. on in the middle second trimester nothing really happens more than 36 weeks it's neonatal infection that we are worried about so sir coming to the next situation which is actually more common that the child has her, her, her child has chicken pox and she is pregnant and she is getting affected she get she got yeah. so i think this is what most of us have faced with our patients yes so what would be your next question to the mother well the next question to the mother is how pregnant is she because again that that would be the same answer as we have given earlier now uh, if we have uh, before 20 weeks and she's terrified of having got infected we'll say okay you have this the other thing of course is to check whether she's varicella immune or not and if she's non immune then like i said we give her a, a vzig right 
Right. So I think simple question, if the child had chicken pox, the first question is we ask the mother, did you ever have a chicken pox? If you had chicken pox, just be happy about it. Nothing's going to happen to you because you're immune. And if you did not have chicken pox, then within 10 days, we can give her varicella immunoglobulin and acyclovir as post-exposure prophylaxis. So I think uh, that's it for the cases. And I think it's been an exhaustive list of cases to conclude. Serology for diagnosis of maternal infection needs to be interpreted very carefully. Definite role of ultrasound in prediction and monitoring of congenital infection as has been extensively discussed. Invasive testing should be done to confirm fetal affection. And there is uh, no drug really to prevent perinatal transmission except for toxoplasmosis and now evolving for CMV as valacyclovir. And prevention of infection remains the mainstay. But what we can go home is that this is a real uh, existence of torch infections, but then we really need to understand the interpretation of these infections before actually jumping to conclusions and the management really remains on actual and correct interpretation of the infections in pregnancy. So thank you so much. And I thank all the panelists for this beautiful discussion. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, thank you. Open. We still yeah, have a few yeah. great efforts. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Thank Dr. So Aparna, much. Dr. Anubhuti. That was the most exquisite panel discussion we've ever had. And, you know, I thank all the panelists for making it a user. You can look at the watch. We've been talking for three hours and we still have more than 350 people locked in. That speaks volumes about your expertise and knowledge for the subject. I thank you all. I just... Uh, there are a few questions. I think Dr. Kurana is coming to it before Dr. Chobal gives a thank you note. Yeah. Um, one is that we may not have answers for everything, but we do have uh, one issue of our journal, um, um, our, our pink journal, as we call it, the Journal of Fetal Medicine. And the uh, issue that we had, the January to March issue uh, this year, has given you a complete summary of the literature that we have discussed today. And uh, apart from the actual ISWAG recommendations, which came up uh, now, everything else is included in that. So you could use that as a reference point. For those of you who uh, want uh, our members, you will have free access uh, to this via the website. And for those of you who wish to buy a copy, you can be in touch with the, uh, the SFM Secretariat and we'd be happy to supply those at a cost. Uh, we have some very interesting questions and I sort of summarized them because we were so short of time. And we'll take up the more relevant ones which have not been completely answered. And uh, can I shoot these, Aparna, before uh, we do a Thanksgiving? And the first was a simple question on uh, cesarean section for, for herpes simplex virus. Uh, yes, positive. Sir, it is around, uh, around term, we should do. Yeah. Uh, the next question was on the cost of the MMR vaccine. And it's about 50 rupees truly, or is it 150 rupees? And so it's really an expensive vaccine and we really don't have to worry about costs as far as this is concerned. Uh, the other question was, uh, can we differentiate between the fetal growth restriction of triploidy and the fetal growth restriction of an infection? Uh, can I have Nathan to answer this question or anybody I on mean, the panel? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, fetal infection, you could have this or combination of uh, growth restriction with more like a Whereas in triploidy, we always have severe oligomnia. It's very difficult to see the fetus. And the appearance of placenta is quite different. In triploidy, typically we see the like sort of cystic areas, Swiss cheese sort of a thing. Whereas in a fetal infection, the placenta is uniformly enlarged in an infection or it will be uniformly ecogenic. Of course, one would do an invasive test uh, to uh, find out. Yeah. And, and not only are, on cell uh, IUGR, uh, severe ones will definitely have infection and the aneuploidy panel. So uh, that yeah. is also one thing. We only would not rule out infection. Yeah. And then what about uh, uh, the two questions related, unilateral or bilateral ventricular megaline infection? And uh, the second question was on uh, whether when we are looking at, uh, at, at, these, uh, uh, at, at the findings of high drops, can we differentiate between infection high drops and non-infection high drops? So unilateral, bilateral ventricular, we all know that more or less the significance is the same. I mean, it again, it, it depends more on the size of the ventricles rather than, uh, uh, than whether it's unilateral or bilateral. I mean, the prognosis wise and investigation wise also, we'll be more or less doing the same. So it all depends upon if one side of the ventricle has an hemorrhage, then we would get adhesions on that side and we can have a unilateral ventricular mechanic. So we definitely look out for all the signs of infection. 
and if everything else is normal and you have a unilateral ventricular myopathy, we will investigate just like a mild ventricular myopathy, and the prognosis would be just like a mild or moderate ventricular myopathy, depending upon the size. Then there is a few set of questions which are actually on uh, uh, on on actual values. Um, what values do we use for torch teeters? And of course, it varies from lab to lab. Uh, the second question was on uh, whether we repeat rising teeters at two, three, or four or six weeks. Doctor Parna, could you uh, label that? We, we can't hear you. Sorry, two weeks. Two weeks. Correct. Two weeks. And uh, the other question uh, was that that. Uh, Uh, can we use absolute cutoffs at any point? Yes, of course we can use absolute cutoffs at any point. The third question is the uh, the range of avidity teeters. Uh, what is low? What is intermediate? And what is high? Generally, it is taken as less than thirty and more 30%. than but thirty to sixty is usually intermediate, but uh, it is taken. So more than thirty is supposed to be you know you take it as high and consider it like that. Yeah, and then Dr. Teal and Praveen had a question for us and. He wants to know whether the foramen cranial uh, distance uh, can be used for the microcephaly of infections. Yes, it can be. It is one of the factors to diagnose microcephaly apart from FC and BPD. Yeah, and uh, his, his other question was: uh, Should we do uh, a PCR straight away uh, or torch teeters when we suspecting an infection? Uh, should no, we just go ahead and maternal, maternal, the maternal fetal will go hand in hand. Yeah. So we must screen our patients appropriately and then do it. There's a whole lot of questions that came up in the earlier part, and that was on how to interpret the IgGs and the IgMs. And I think we pretty much uh, covered that uh, all. And there are only two questions left, then, which is uh, which are specific. One is the association between a large placenta and an infection. How specific is it a sign? And the role of placental biopsy uh, postnatally. So Professor Eaves will actually states a lot of importance on the placenta which gets involved in infection because that's the first site where the transplacental mm -hmm. transfer will go. And he had stated long time back that a placenta more than four point five centimeters is actually which is a dirty looking placenta. This should raise your bar uh, for infection. So it's got a very high association with infection, placenta megaly and uh, placental biopsy. Definitely, if the fetuses are going for termination. and autopsy actually is a very important parameter to correlate our ultrasound and infection serology you say you can have inclusion bodies in cmv you can have villitis and that can lead to give you answers which may not have uh, come up if the patient is not opted for any invasive procedure so a postnatal autopsy or a placental uh, again placenta with the fetus is extremely important for correlation the only thing is uh, puja the thing is that uh... Pathology has to be experienced when it comes yeah. to placental biopsy. It's not. Uh, yeah. It's not a very easy thing. So I mean, that is one factor we need to keep in yeah. mind. And then the good placental pathology seems to have a long waiting list. Some of them give us reports after six months or nine months, yeah. and that can be quite disturbing when it comes to terminated pregnancies and things like that. And uh, I guess that completes the list of questions. We have one more trade partners um, video to play before we close and and do our Thanksgiving. And if I may. Take that one minute, uh, Sumit. Can we have that last uh, uh, trade partner uh, video? Yes, sir. Give me a second. Yeah. The uh, we've been very lucky with our, our trade partner association with webinars. Everybody just wants to be associated with us, and of course, today's webinar is no exception. We had over five hundred people at peak. Here we go. Thanks so much, um, Mohit. Back to you. Now, I, I wish to hand over the proceedings to Dr. Nitin Chobal. 
for the thank you. So I have answer. this uh, pleasant task of thank thanking everyone. So first of all, uh, to our partners, trade partners, without which uh, things life is difficult. Unfortunately, as Ashok said, we are lucky that uh, everyone supports us. So today, especially Life Cell and Dr. Lal's Pathological Lab, I have to thank Mohit because he has sort of reactivated the Mumbai chapter of SFM. Because I think we were dormant to some extent, but uh, we promised that we'll we'll definitely come back, jump back. And I have promised them that once things go normal, the next SFM meeting will be in my center. So that that's a promise. thanks to ashok for having given us this opportunity to host this and i think this was a wonderful meet and i thank all the uh, audience i mean we had almost 500 people logged in at one time 700 registration which at this time of era when people are tired of uh, you know the webinars and were sad people have started is a big big number uh, thanks to all the speakers we had wonderful talks from vandana and chandra as usual and aparna i mean this uh, panel discussion was exceptional i would say and both anirudhi and aparna and uh, the first time she gave us an outline i i saw the email it was 4:15 in the morning so either aparna has not been sleeping or she has been getting up at 4 o'clock whatever it is but fantastic efforts from you and a really really uh, great uh, uh, panel discussions i mean so all in all and thanks to uh, all the audience most important for staying back and sfm will always be active in our priority thank you all good night stay safe and have a happy diwali thank you and, thank uh, you everyone and my chance to wish dr nitin chobal for his birthday tomorrow uh, for those of us who are not good at remembering birthday there's a reminder to wish him tomorrow <laughs> thanks many happy birthday many happy birthday many happy returns of the day bye bye